Section one of The Whys of Cooking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Whys of Cooking by Janet Mackenzie Hill. Section one. Introduction. Every age has had its cooking problems. Brillat Savarin, the French authority on good eating, declared, The destiny of nations depends upon the manner in which they feed themselves. Knowledge of how to cook and what to cook is now a recognized science, closely related both to happier life and to longer life. Every housewife has her own puzzling whys of cooking. The use of Crisco for frying, for shortening, and for cake making has helped solve so many of them that we frankly acknowledge that this book is published to give greater publicity to the exceptional qualities of crisco and to show why successful cooking today in hundreds of thousands of homes is linked quite naturally with thoughts of this perfected cooking product the whys of cooking oud one-time chef of louis the sixteenth said prominence in cookery never occurs under thirty years of age and nothing but consummate experience can elevate one to the rank of chief professor in connection with diligent and studious application one must also possess no small share of intellect what then is to become of our families while the mother is reaching the age of thirty the first years of housekeeping are the most important the period when the digestive habits of young children are forming then if ever the home should be provided with well-prepared food when the prudent thoughtful housewife takes from the oven a loaf of sour bread or a cake with a heavy streak through it or when her pie runs over and the best part of it is left in the oven she is most desirous of knowing why these things have occurred and she sets herself to find out the cause that she may avoid a repetition of such mistakes two hundred years ago in the time of oud each individual housekeeper worked out the remedy for these and other culinary mishaps only after many repetitions of the same bad results after an expenditure of valuable time and thought together with a waste of foodstuffs the earnest worker discovered that certain conditions being present certain results would surely follow and these discoveries are now the rightful inheritance of the housekeeper of today she should not be obliged to begin her work where her ancestors began but should continue where they left off and better still from the point at which her foremost sister of to-day has arrived when a young housekeeper realizes that in making yeast bread she is dealing with actual plants that must thrive and grow if her bread is to be good she will understand why warm rather than scalding liquid must be mixed with her yeast and henceforth she is likely to care for her miniature garden with intelligent forethought to the housewife some knowledge of the whys and wherefores of processes in cooking as in all other processes means to be forearmed and in putting her knowledge into practice she may avoid much mortification of spirit as well as pecuniary loss and what is of greater value still insurance of a more cheerful and contented family such then is the motive for this little book in its pages are to be set down the reasons why for instance meringues and souffles fall why bread is sometimes sour pastry soggy and cake heavy why it is best to use a knife for one process and a spoon for another why we should use bread flour in yeast mixtures and pastry flour for cakes and pastry all these and many other hints and suggestions are herein set forth and made plain that she who runs may read and be the gainer thereby in money and time health and comfort nor is this all for we must include herein something of the wise in serving our full duty to our friends and the guests whom we invite to share our meals is not done when we have simply set before them well prepared food while one dish may constitute a meal more often the meal is made up of several dishes and the several dishes combined in a meal must be given particular attention first of all the dishes presented together to be eaten at one meal 
should conform to physiological demands and secondly they should be chosen to produce harmony of color texture and flavor to know why certain vegetables salads and sauces are served with fish and why certain other vegetables salads and sauces with steak and chops is to know the joy of the discoverer for in the actual doing of these things you yourself become a discoverer it was la Reynier who truly said the kitchen is a country in which there are always discoveries to be made in these pages also may be found why certain dishes are chosen for dinner others for luncheon and still others for sunday night tea or supper in short through its questions and answers the aim of the book is to offer information and suggestions such as are needful to every housekeeper of necessity our space is limited and some points upon which light is desired may have been omitted but this will not work to disadvantage if the habit of asking why and of searching for the answer becomes formed no woman with a family in her care should be satisfied until she knows the why of each and every operation that is carried on in her especial domain the kitchen end of section one Section two of The Wise of Cooking by Janet Mackenzie Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Story of Crisco. What Crisco is. Crisco is the rich cream of vegetable oil, delicate, odorless, and tasteless, a product of unusual merit, ideal for frying, for shortening, and for cake making. Crisco is a primary fat which has numerous advantages over lard butter compounds margarines or butterings four years of severest tests and exhaustive experiments in which crisco demonstrated its value as a wholesome nutritious absolutely pure cooking fat prefaced its introduction to the public it was under such exacting conditions of faithful research that crisco was perfected crisco's success for eight years crisco has been marketed with such growing favor that it is an accepted staple handled by progressive dealers in every state and province on the american continent it is significant that millions of competent housewives as well as many dietitians and chefs have chosen to use crisco to the exclusion of other cooking fats in many schools of domestic science crisco is given the preference because it is a vegetable product absolutely pure entirely wholesome and of a dependable uniform quality that makes good results certain crisco is recognized as a better product its use quickly becomes a habit for there is no substitute for crisco as a rich food fat for cooking the manufacture of crisco crisco is the brand name of a pure cooking fat made possible by the hydrogenizing processes in use by the procter and gamble company only such a process can convert vegetable oil into a rich cream such as crisco the oil is filtered given its proper consistency by the addition of pure hydrogen and then sterilized by very high heat nothing but hydrogen is added to the oil to gain this consistency essential to the easy and proper combining of crisco with flour and sugar this hydrogenizing process is responsible for the peculiar virtues of crisco crisco is what is known in chemistry as a synthetic product i e a fat made to order this makes it possible so to govern the process of hydrogenizing that the resulting product shall have fewer faults than a natural product a cooking fat made by this process such as crisco has less tendency to become rancid to smoke when heated and give off strong odor and the true shortening components are present in greater percentage the details of this hydrogenizing process are controlled exclusively by the procter and gamble company the crisco building the crisco building devoted solely to the preparation of crisco is a handsome modern structure of rugged stone and brick it stands quite alone within spacious grounds that during the rest hours are used for tennis and other outdoor recreations the vast rooms are walled with glass and flooded by sunlight 
which shines through windows that never need be opened for the air and circulation throughout the factory is water washed driven into the rooms dust free and germ free pure every employee is dressed in white daily changes of clothing are made the floors of the crisco building are of terrazzo pillars ceiling and refrigerating tunnels are of white tile corners everywhere are rounded to make constant cleaning a simple matter these spotless appointments plenty of pure air and floods of bright sunlight are what keep crisco pure in its passage through the packing room not a human hand ever touches crisco either in process of manufacture or packing it is put into bright new vacuum cleaned cans by machinery which is nickeled enameled and kept spotlessly clean crisco passes automatically through the tiled refrigerators in fact even the labeling and wrapping are done by marvelous machines that grasp the cans with fingers of steel and do the work more deftly than human hands the tribute of the ages the nation which outlived all others in the world's history put up barriers against lard centuries ago to the jew crisco proved welcome for the good reason that it conformed strictly to his important dietary laws being kosher and a parava or neutral fat it can be used with both milchig and fleichig milk and flesh foods while crisco sold to the jewish trade carries a kosher seal certified by rabbi margolis of new york nevertheless all crisco is kosher and of identical purity the uniform purity and quality of crisco crisco never varies either in purity or quality its absolute cleanliness is another unfailing advantage which means so much to the housewife who is anxious that nothing may enter into her cooking which might impair its wholesomeness one can of crisco is the same as another can of crisco it is the same as it was yesterday and as it will be tomorrow because of this uniformity crisco is in a class by itself there is no substitute for it from the time it leaves the factory in airtight tins until it is opened in your own kitchen crisco is never exposed unequaled for frying successful frying is an art someone has said that frying is cooking in boiling fat this is not quite accurate but the temperature of the cooking fat must be hot enough virtually to roast the surface of the food yet not hot enough to cause it to scorch foods fried in crisco look appetizing because crisco gives up its heat so quickly that a tender brown crust forms almost instantly thereby allowing the inside of the food to bake instead of to become soaked with grease with crisco came the revelation that it is possible to fry foods without spoiling the taste of the food itself by the flavor of the cooking fat used crisco odorless and flavorless with its delicate clean freshness brings out all the natural dainty appetizing flavor of the food fried chicken takes on a new taste and fried eggs are as delicate as if they were poached fried fish and fried oysters have new appetizing flavors potatoes either white or sweet are unusually tasty when fried in crisco saratoga chips are different crisp and appetizing without the grease which comes with the old method of preparation housewives who use crisco in making doughnuts quickly acquire the reputation of making the best doughnuts in the neighborhood salted almonds and peanuts have a new appeal when prepared in crisco crisco meets the severest tests in deep fat frying and all other frying by using crisco you banish the greasy taste so often found in foods the secret of good pastry pastry shortened with crisco is light flaky tender and crisp it is easy to digest some of the most distinguished chefs in the land who pride themselves on the superiority of their pastries are using crisco for their finest foods pies made with crisco are more delicious the crust will break at the touch of a fork unchanged fats the general impression is that all foods are changed in cooking the fact is that all shortening remains unchanged for instance if you make a pie with lard nearly one-third of the crust by weight is composed of raw lard the same is true if crisco is used fats are not changed in cooking unless sometimes for the worse 
thus the desirability of using the purely vegetable and wholesome crisco is all the more apparent good cake making cake made with crisco is unusually rich and tasteful stays moist and fresh a surprisingly long time and costs less butter always much more expensive than crisco is no longer an essential to success in cake making crisco is so delicate to work with that it is used with equally successful results in the simplest and plainest as well as in the richest fruit or layer cakes crisco all shortening crisco is all shortening even the very best grades of butter contain nearly one-fifth water curd and salt the salt is added to preserve the butter and give it flavor while salt gives flavor it adds no richness and water has no value as shortening crisco contains no water and needs no salt to keep it sweet water and salt can be added in the needed proportions but the use of crisco lessens by one-fifth the amount of shortening required a bread baking suggestion to brush bread with crisco during the last rising makes it brown more easily giving it a fine nutty flavor and aids in the formation of a thin tender crust if you would like to give your bread a fine butter crust after baking brush with salted crisco as the bread comes hot from the oven the proportions are one teaspoonful of salt to one half cupful of crisco these splendid uses of crisco in bread making improve the texture make the color better and the taste richer the plan more generally in use of covering newly baked bread with the cloth drives in the moisture and makes bread soggy and less appetizing to brush over with crisco prevents crusts from hardening without lessening their crispness and makes every crumb edible idealized cooking kitchens are kept sweeter when crisco is used there are no irritating odors of superheated fats the reason why is clear butter will smoke at a temperature of three hundred twenty nine degrees lard at four hundred while crisco does not smoke until it reaches four hundred fifty five degrees this is heat much higher than necessary for frying mothers find that cookies made with crisco are wholesome appetizing sweets for the children fudge taffies and other candies made with crisco are exceptionally good in all the affairs of life good digestion plays a most important part all foods made with crisco are digested more easily a child can understand the reason for this the normal temperature of the human body is ninety eight and two fifth degrees crisco melts at ninety seven degrees which is less than body temperature thus enabling the digestive juices to mix freely with it the melting point of lard is about one hundred five degrees and that of lard compounds even higher stearine used in so many compounds is hard and indigestible you can fry fish then onions and then potatoes in the same crisco and each dish will retain its own distinctive taste with no suggestion of the other simply strain the melted crisco through cheesecloth and crisco retains all its original purity and sweetness if there are any whys in your own cooking or in the use of crisco which puzzle you do not hesitate to take up these questions with us we want you to feel that we are at your service glad of any opportunity to help you in the cause of better foods for better foods will figure largely in making a better nation sincerely yours the proctor and gamble company end of section two section three of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b modern kitchens cleanliness and convenience are back of a good kitchen cleanliness requires careful thought for walls floors absence of mouldings closeting of utensils plenty of sunshine and fresh air starting with the floor there are four possible finishes the old-fashioned wooden floor without finish the wooden floor oiled with crude oil or asbestic composition the wooden floor without finish requires too much scrubbing to be cleanly the oiled floor though undoubtedly a serviceable one is unsightly but either linoleum or asbestic composition is desirable both are easily cleaned 
the latter is a yielding substance like cork and is laid over any wooden flooring the walls of a kitchen should be painted and preferably in yellow or light tan where the room lacks window lighting and in light green or blue where the room is full of sunshine a wainscot of tile is ideal but expensive mouldings are dust catchers and should be avoided ventilation and light are of course important where one is building it is desirable to have windows on opposite sides to gain a cross current of air a window over sink or at one side of it admits light and air where it is greatly needed in screening the kitchen windows see that the screens slide so as to be adjustable for top or bottom sash then upper or lower window can be opened as required in very warm weather there is a noticeable cooling of air when the upper window sashes are lowered as the warm air that rises to the ceiling will find a ventilating current of air from window to window under the subject of cleanliness comes the hand sink this admits of hand washing without recourse to the sink in which dishes may be standing and should be regarded as a necessity rather than as a luxury on leaving the kitchen even for a few moments one's hands come in contact with doors chairs stair rails telephone and with many other objects much handled and liable to hold germs that are dangerous to health for this reason anyone occupied with the handling of food should wash and dry his hands again and again passing to the consideration of convenience size of kitchen is the first item naturally it depends much on the number of persons using it or the locality of it whether in the limitations of city residences or the more extensive areas of country houses but there is one general principle that is always most important that the range sink table cupboard storage shelves must all be arranged in proper relation to each other to save steps they should be grouped in as compact a space as possible then let each utensil be kept as near as possible to the place where it is used and to the place where it is cleaned after use to illustrate the general principle cited above we show two kitchens one small and the other somewhat larger from these two beginnings almost any combination of features can be built up these to suit the personal taste and wants of the individual it is obvious that no set plan will suit everybody plan a floor plan shows the smaller kitchen arranged in almost a square looking at this plan as you see it on the page it shows the upper wall and the right wall opening outdoors while the lower wall and the left wall open to other rooms of the house in upper wall there would be window and outside door with half glass panel and in the right wall two windows in the lower wall is the entrance to the dining room this being near to the range a feature always desirable because of the short carriage of food from stove to table in this plan we provide no pantry or other separating passageway between kitchen and dining room this feature is shown in the plan of the larger kitchen keeping in mind the lower and the right hand walls here we group the range the table and the kitchen cabinet this gives you the storage place of groceries and utensils from which the cooking process starts then the table is at your right the place where the food is prepared and at the right of the table is the stove the next successive utensil from the range the next step is to the door of the dining room after the meal the dishes go to the sink and from there to the dishware closet at left wall here again the dishes for the dining table are close to the range for serving it will be seen that the only crossing of the room is to get the cold storage foods from the refrigerator in the upper left hand corner in the illustration on page thirteen we show the lower wall as it appears on floor plan and the right hand wall as it appears on floor plan at left of picture a corner of the sink shows this sink appearing on the upper wall on the floor plan in the illustration we have the three objects in a cluster the cabinet the work table and the range these three units are the ones that are used in the preparation of foods and this grouping saves many steps it is understood that no particular set of stove table and cabinet will suit every individual but we give here the working principle which is nearest 
the practical labor-saving arrangement any range can be substituted for the one we show any table can be used and any kind of shelving or cupboard can replace the kitchen cabinet but the general idea of having the food utensil unit next to the table unit and the table next to the stove unit is a good one all sorts of variations can be made without disturbing this central idea of cluster for instance a shelf and hook rack for condiments spoons and forks used continually in preparation of food could be placed against the wall just over the table the table can be of plain wooden top but the ideal covering is zinc also this table could be on broad easy shifting casters so that it could be used in any part of the kitchen required we have suggested here a small kitchen without expensive built-in features but when we consider the sink then the very best should be had this sink can be of white enamel or slate which is best as a matter of individual taste the enamel is cleaner looking but not so serviceable where hard usage is necessary the height of the sink is important but here again the individual should determine his particular likings but there should be a grooved drain board on either side of the sink this drain board set at a slight angle to ensure draining into the sink against the left hand wall as seen on the floor plan is the refrigerator and an enclosed cabinet for storing the cleaning articles such as broom dustpan floor brushes etc the refrigerator would be better were it built in as in the plan of the large kitchen but we give this arrangement as the best for a simple kitchen without expensive features the refrigerator would be near the entrance door handy for insertion of the ice in selecting a refrigerator be sure to obtain one that is well insulated with eight to twelve thicknesses in the walls the cabinet for holding the cleaning articles should be provided with a door the whole width of the front stove polish oils for the floor mops brooms brushes will be stored away from the open kitchen and yet be at hand for ready service as this plan has a gas range this kitchen would require a radiator for heating purposes this appears at left of sink to the right of the gas range is a hot water boiler with gas water heater plan b this plan shows a larger kitchen about fourteen by sixteen feet with best of equipment the entire upper wall as it appears on floor plan is open to out of doors and the upper half of the right hand and the left hand walls is open to the air thus one half of the wall space is cut with windows and the outside entrance the lower wall as it appears on the plan and the lower half of the right hand and the left hand walls are partitions for other rooms for ventilation the two windows over the sink at left and the window in the right wall provide a cross current of air besides there is a window and a glass panel door in the upper wall the doors are four that of the upper wall leading to the porch that in the right hand wall to the butler's pantry and those in the lower wall to the cellar and upstairs this back stairs for servants use is always desirable referring to the illustration on page fifteen we have the left hand wall and the upper wall as they appear on the floor plan the second illustration on page fourteen gives the right hand and the lower walls as they appear on the floor plan in the illustration on page fifteen we have the group of range sink grocery cabinet and table the table would be on rollers and be provided with a zinc top its size would vary from two by three feet to three by five feet this could be pushed near to the other three articles of the group also the built-in grocery cabinet would be provided with sliding boards here would be kept all articles of food not necessarily placed in the refrigerator the shelves and racks for tins are to the left of the stove but do not appear in the illustration thus the working group of provision cabinet work table stove and tin closet four units closely interrelated are reinforced by a fifth unit the sink another view of the same kitchen the illustration on page fourteen shows the built-in refrigerator with an outside door for insertion of ice the feature of this fixture note the plan on page fifteen is the provision of three outside walls 
ensuring a cool storage place that means saving in ice bills and perfect refrigeration to the right of the window is the cabinet for cleaning utensils next to this is the door to pantry and then the door to cellar to the right of this door is the shelving for pots and kettles this shelving is but a step to the range the sink for washing dishes is practically the same as noted in the small kitchen plan there would be a hand sink of white enamel see illustration on page fifteen right hand side we have already emphasized the importance of clean hands in the kitchen above the sink would be a roll of tissue towels which when torn off after use can be burnt heat would be applied by a radiator in the upper left hand corner as it appears on floor plan the range as we show it is a cabinet gas range with a six burner top a shelf and hood above it below is a twenty inch baking oven a broiling oven and a second baking oven this latter provided with a glass door over the second oven is a plate warming closet a hot water boiler and gas water heater stand next to the range here again as in the case of the smaller kitchen all sorts of variations are possible to suit the individual but the general plan shows a basis of practical working kitchen on page sixteen is the butler's pantry by referring to the floor plan of the larger kitchen the agreement of this illustration and the plan is apparent there is a window with a small sink for filling the water glasses the open shelves will take care of much used china while the closed shelves will contain the rarer china in the drawer space can be kept the table linen and the table silver the following list of kitchen articles will be of help to the housekeeper in selecting the furnishings naturally the number in the family determines the size and quantity of utensils such as pans and kettles use only the highest grade of enamel wear as the cheaper kinds chip off be careful to avoid wares that chemically affect the foods tea kettle kettle coffee pot steamer stew pan pint saucepan quart saucepan two quart double boiler wire broiler frying pans scotch bowl for frying covered roasting pan earthenware baking pan bread pans cake pans muffin pans pie pans baking dishes earthen cups cookie tins potato masher colanders strainer flour sifter bread mixer mixing balls mixing spoons pint and quart measures scales molding boards rolling pin can opener corkscrew meat knife and fork steel table knife steel paring knife bread knife knife sharpener meat grinder meat axe meat board chopping knife steel forks cover skewers wire toasters nutmeg graters flour dredgers magic cover lemon squeezer large grater coffee mill salt shaker spoons egg beater wire strainers bone salt spoon wooden and steel spatulas towel rack hand towels needle coarse thread soap shaker scraper for sink dish pan dish towels rinsing pans soap dishes bins for flour sugar meals spice containers clock end of section three section four of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b section four serving the effect of properly cooked food may be almost entirely lost by lack of care in its serving the proper serving of food relates not only to its actual disposal on the serving dish but as reference to the appearance and temperature of the room in which it is served the manner in which the table is laid and the furnishings of the table may make or mar a meal to say that we eat with our eyes should not be called an exaggeration for if food be presented in a neat orderly and pleasing manner its appearance will cause a flow of the digestive juices not only occasion an appetite for food but supply the ability to digest it food in individual portions should be disposed on a serving dish to present a symmetrical outline the dish should not look crowded 
and at least one third of the space should be free from even a garnish let hot food be presented hot and cold food properly chilled russian english and compromise services three forms of table service are recognized the english the russian and the compromise which is a combination of the other two the russian style of service is formal and is attempted in full only when the attendants are skilful and numerous in this form of service no food save bonbons relishes or salted nuts appears upon the table everything is served from the side good russian service implies that no one at table be obliged to ask for anything he needs thus if one is to eat a dish with a sauce the same must immediately follow the dish rolls water butter sauces and salads must be supplied at the instant they are desired to attend to the wants of six or eight people at table at least one attentive skilful maid will be needed besides the cook the food separated into individual portions is either set down from the right hand before those at table or plates being in place the food separated into individual portions is passed to the left of each that each may help himself or be helped by the one in attendance dishes of food are not set down upon the table but are returned to the serving table or the pantry from which place they are taken when a second helping is desired when true english service is essayed all the food belonging to one course as meat hot vegetables green salad bread is set upon the table and served from it the plates being passed by a maid it is then cleared away before another course is brought in when the compromise service is used some courses as a choice vegetable or a salad are served from the table english style and some are brought in from the pantry in individual portions and set in place russian style in brief food served english style is served from the table served russian style it is served from the side while a combination of the two is the compromise style let your dining table be not too highly polished but well built and as handsome a piece of furniture as your conscience will allow economize on some other piece of furniture for linen use doilies runners or a cloth for breakfast and luncheon but choose a fine damask cloth for the serious business of dining send if you must all other articles to the public laundry but have table linen laundered at home when laying the table first of all protect it by some sort of an inner covering a silence cloth of table padding or an asbestos mat the exact size of the table covered with cotton are used under a damask cloth small covered pads are used under doilies in laundering a tablecloth fold once lengthwise exactly through the center then when ironed roll on a pasteboard cylinder let the cloth hang the same distance from the floor on all sides let floral decorations accord with the size of the table and the style of service from one to three small blossoms are all that is desirable on a table less than five feet in diameter laying the table and the cover no matter what the style of serving with or without a maid the laying of the table as far as the covers are concerned is always the same by cover is meant the place plate plate which marks the place of an individual glasses silver and napkin to be used by each individual the covers on opposite sides of the table should be directly opposite each other or in case of an odd number equally distant from each other the place plates at least ten inches in diameter should be set at the center of the cover one inch from the edge of the table at the right of the plate lay the knife soup spoon and fork for oysters or hors d'oeuvres in the order of use the one first used farthest from the plate the cutting edge of the knife should be towards the plate the bowl of the spoon upwards at the left of the plate set the forks tines upward the one first used farthest from the plate with the napkin beyond it if a maid be in attendance the silver for the dessert should be set in place after the table is cleared for the dessert course at a meal where no knife is required as often at sunday night tea or a chafing dish spread place the fork at the right hand 
if only one other piece of silver be required as dessert spoon or fork set this also at the right the one first used farthest from the plate do not crowd the several articles of the cover let them lie rather compactly and in such manner that the whole may form a separate unit in the centre of twenty to thirty inches of space at the point of the knife set the glass of water the bread and butter plate or the tiny chip for butter is set at the left of the glass bread and butter plates are for home use and especially at breakfast and luncheon butter is not supposed to be needed at dinner and only the tiny chip is in evidence the place for the spreader is across the top of the plate handle towards the right salt and pepper receptacles are set between each two covers suggestions on serving meals without a maid with one exception the laying of the table as far as the covers are concerned is always the same whether a maid or a member of the family is to serve the meal when the meal is served by someone sitting at table all flat silver is to be used during the meal is given a place on the table when it is laid silver for the dessert may be set above the plate handles toward the right this is the preferred position the only other position possible as the dessert is served last is between the knife for the roast and the plate this disposal of the silver is in accordance with the accepted custom of placing flat silver in the order of its use the piece first used farthest from the plate this position for the small pieces of silver used with the dessert detracts from the symmetry of the cover and it seems preferable to dispose it above the plate when a maid is in attendance flat silver for the sweet course is set in place just before serving this course as far as possible save those in the final sweet course every article of food that is not to be kept hot for a time should be set in place on the table before the call to the meal is given plates of hot and cold bread a reserve supply of butter pitcher of water cream and sugar jelly relishes and all condiments that are liable to be called for should be grouped upon the table in a symmetrical manner just before announcing the meal fill the glasses with water set individual dishes of butter in place then while the family is assembling bring in the coffee or tea if it is to be served at the beginning of the meal and such other hot dishes as are provided on a wheel tray or on a small light table on casters after the substantial course is eaten the wheel tray is at hand for the removal of all food from the table and the used china and silver in a large family remove the food first and return with the wheel tray for the dishes then crumb the table and on again returning to the dining room bring in on the tray the dessert and the china for its service the wheel tray lessens the trips to and from the kitchen often in a small family and where the hot dish is the one served first the second course with china may stand on the tray at the left hand of the mistress of the house and she need not rise from the table until the close of the meal wise of serving in general one why use a silence cloth under a tablecloth answer an inner covering over a table protects the table ensures against noise and improves the appearance of even the choicest damask two why sometimes use doilies or runners instead of a tablecloth answer doilies and runners are more easily laundered than tablecloths in case of accident the table is more easily restored to a good condition with a rectangular shaped table runners suitable for two covers on opposite sides of the table and a dish as bread between them are very satisfactory three why are the knives soup spoon and hors d'oeuvre fork set at the right of the plate and all other forks at the left of the plate answer the silver set at the right of the plate is that which is to be used with the right hand the silver at the left of the plate is that which is to be used with the left hand if no knives are needed the dishes presented being such as are eaten with forks at a sunday night tea chafing dish spreads etc the forks would be set at the right of the plate four why is the silver laid in order of use the piece first used farthest from the plate answer this method of laying the table 
being widely known and followed settles the question as to the piece of silver to be used for each course as it appears on the table also as the silver thus laid is used and removed the cover is left in a neat and compact hole five why in refilling a glass of water should the glass be drawn to the edge of the table by the bottom of the glass or if the table is crowded be lifted by the bottom of the glass answer because the hand of the attendant should not come in contact with the top of the glass six why should a tray be used to pass cream and sugar or two relishes answer several small dishes may be passed at one time on a tray which otherwise would have to be passed separately seven why not serve each vegetable in an individual dish answer small dishes cumber the table make work and with the exception of chilled plates for salad served with the fish or roast serve no essential purpose eight why as far as possible should all piles of plates be eliminated from the table at which people are sitting answer piles of plates obstruct the view and are in the way of the one who carves or serves in serving without a maid the plates may be set on a wheel tray or small table at the side of the table in serving english fashion the maid brings two plates one in each hand sets the one in her left hand before the carver takes up the filled plate and sets it before the one for whom it is prepared she returns with one plate which she exchanges for the prepared plate waiting for her and so continues wise of serving russian style one why use a damask cloth over a silence cloth for the dinner table answer dinner is the principal meal of the day and calls for as formal and dignified accessories as the style of living permits and a table completely covered with white carries out this idea two why in serving a meal russian style is nothing set upon the table at any time save the china and silver belonging to the individual covers the flowers bonbons and perhaps salted nuts answer all of the food is served by the attendants and they can take the food from side tables and pantry more easily than from the table at which the guests are seated also a dish is no addition to the appearance of the table after part of it has been served three why sometimes make an exception in favor of a fruit cocktail choice strawberries prepared grapefruit or raw oysters served in a first course answer this first course set in place before announcing the meal adds to the decorative character of the table and may be considered as a part of the table decoration four why are serving tables at either end of the dining room almost a necessary feature in a well-equipped dining room answer serving tables at the ends of the dining room make for efficiency and quick service five why should food prepared on individual plates be set down at the right hand of those seated at table and a platter of food from which one is to help himself or be helped be presented at the left hand answer seated at table one cannot help himself easily to anything presented at his right hand end of section four Section 5 of The Wise of Cooking by Janet Mackenzie Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Section 5. Frying. 1. Why are fried foods so pleasing to the taste? Answer. When food is properly fried, the outside is seared over so quickly that the flavor and juices within are retained in full. Also, the outside is caramelized as it were giving an additional flavor that is most enjoyable two why are properly fried articles free of all excess of fat answer if articles made of flour as fritters and doughnuts contain eggs in sufficient quantity and the fat be at the right temperature when they are set to cook the fat will coagulate the egg upon the outside and make a covering which the fat cannot penetrate in the same manner fat is excluded from croquettes cutlets fish oysters etc 
coated with egg and crumbs. 3. Why is a cast-iron round-bottom scotch bowl a good utensil for frying purposes? Answer. The scotch bowl stands firm on the stove. It is not injured by heat and is of such shape that without calling for a large quantity of fat, it holds enough to cover the articles to be cooked. 4. Why use a basket in frying such articles as croquettes, oysters, etc.? Answer. By the use of a basket, a number of soft articles that require cooking the same length of time may be let down into the fat, drained, and lifted out all at once. 5. Why is it necessary to set the articles in the basket apart, one from another? Answer. If the articles touch each other, steam is formed that softens the otherwise crisp exterior. 6. Why is deep fat frying considered preferable to sautéing? Answer. Because deep fat frying is more economical of fat and the articles so cooked more wholesome. 7. How is deep fat frying more economical than sautéing? Answer. In sautéing an article, after one side is cooked, it is turned to cook the other side. There is no opportunity to drain the cooked side, and exposed to the air, it cools and admits the fat, thus making the process wasteful and the food less digestible. 8. Why is it important in deep frying to use plenty of fat? Answer. Unless there is a good body of fat when cold food is put into it, the temperature is so quickly reduced that no protecting crust is formed, and the food quickly soaks up the fat. It is also important not to push too much cold food into the fat at one time. 9. Why test the temperature of fat with a breadcrumb? Answer. It is less wasteful to test with a crumb than with the uncooked article, especially if the process must be repeated. 10. Why allow only 20 seconds to brown the crumb when French fried potatoes are to be cooked, while 60 seconds are counted before the fat is thought ready for doughnuts and fritters? Answer. The fat for French fried potatoes must be rather hot when the potatoes are lowered into it, as the potatoes being chilled, the temperature is lowered at once. 11. Why set Crisco over the fire in an unheated pan? Answer. Crisco, as all fats, is less wholesome if subjected to too high temperature, and if put into a hot pan, some portion of it is liable to be overheated. 12. Why not wait until Crisco smokes before frying? Answer. When frying with lard, the point at which it smokes is frequently considered as the proper frying temperature. The smoking point of Crisco is considerably higher than the proper frying temperature and if it smokes it is much too hot for proper frying the safest way therefore is to always test the frying medium with the bread crumb thirteen why is the high smoking point of crisco a distinct advantage answer when any fat smokes it decomposes and forms a substance which is irritating to the digestive organs and this substance is absorbed by food fried in smoking fat then, too, it is possible to fry with Crisco and not have a kitchen full of smoke. 14. Why strain fat through two or three folds of cheesecloth each time after frying? Answer. Crisco that has been used contains flour or particles of food. These burn at a much lower temperature than Crisco does, and unless removed will, on reheating, burn and discolor the Crisco. 15. Why is but one kettle of Crisco needed for frying fish, doughnuts, or any other article? Answer. Articles properly fried retain all the flavor and impart none to the fat. To counteract any carelessness in frying, the fat may be clarified by cooking a few slices of raw potato in it. 16. Is it ever advisable to use cracker crumbs, and if so, when and why? If not, why are bread crumbs preferable? Answer. Soft bread crumbs are best to use for coating. They hold more moisture than cracker crumbs and give a better color. 17. Why do doughnuts sometimes crack in frying, occasioning a rough surface? Answer. When doughnuts crack, try adding a little more milk. Probably they have been mixed too stiff. The dough for doughnuts should be as soft as can be handled. 18. 
why does raw potato clarify the fat answer raw potato contains considerable water while frying this water evaporates and carried with it the odors and flavors it has absorbed nineteen why turn doughnuts and fritters repeatedly rather than allow them to cook on one side continuously until done doughnuts and fritters are turned as soon as they rise to the top of the fat and often thereafter that they may be of uniformly fine texture throughout twenty why set all articles taken from the fat at once on soft or tissue paper at the opening of the oven door for a few minutes answer while the article remains hot the soft paper will absorb any surplus of fat on the surface twenty one why use soft fresh bread crumbs rather than dried crumbs for breading articles to be fried answer soft crumbs give a better looking and thinner crust than do dried crumbs twenty two why is it essential that every portion of the croquette fish etc be covered with egg and crumbs answer if any portion of the article be unprotected with the coating fat will enter and the juices will flow out twenty three why is it unnecessary to turn fish cutlets croquettes etc during frying in deep fat answer as the whole object is immersed in hot fat during the whole time of cooking turning is unnecessary twenty four in coating an article with bread crumbs is it always necessary to use egg is the entire egg used or simply the egg white answer eggs are always used in coating articles to be fried in deep fat the whole egg makes the best coating things to remember in connection with these recipes in deep frying do not wait for crisco to smoke heat crisco until a crumb of bread becomes a golden brown in sixty seconds for raw dough mixtures as crullers fritters etc forty seconds for cooked mixtures as croquettes codfish balls etc twenty seconds for french fried potatoes seconds may be counted thus one hundred and one one hundred and two etc the fat may be tested also by dropping into it a little piece of the article to be cooked when it rises to the top bubbles vigorously and brown quickly the fat is hot enough when fried foods absorb it is because crisco is not hot enough or because you have not used enough crisco use plenty and the raw foods if added in small quantities will not reduce the heat of the fat the absorption in deep crisco frying should be less than that of another fat recipes whole fried potatoes crisco for frying whole potatoes paired as the fat bubbles from the water in the potatoes during the whole time of cooking we might perhaps speak of these potatoes as boiled in crisco have the potatoes pared soaked in cold water an hour or more then dried on a cloth select rather small potatoes let cook until they can be pierced with a skewer drain on soft paper at the oven door and serve at once the potatoes should be mealy and are particularly good as many may be cooked at once as the frying kettle will conveniently hold time about half an hour use level measurements for all ingredients doughnuts two and three quarter cupfuls sifted flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful nutmeg one half tablespoonful crisco one egg two-thirds cupful sugar one half cupful milk sift together the flour baking powder salt and nutmeg and with two knives work in the crisco beat the egg and beat in the sugar and the milk and stir into the dry ingredients take out a little at a time on a floured board roll into a sheet cut out with a doughnut cutter and fry in crisco the fat is at the right heat when it browns a crumb of bread in sixty seconds french fried potatoes pare the potatoes cut them in halves lengthwise and then in pieces like the section of an orange let stand in cold water an hour or longer then dry on a soft cloth and fry in hot crisco to a rich straw color and until tender throughout drain on a skimmer and then on soft paper sprinkle with salt and serve at once the fat is at the right heat when it browns a crumb of bread in twenty seconds chicken croquettes 
one quarter cupful crisco one half cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one third teaspoonful black pepper one cupful chicken broth one third cupful cream one egg beaten light one and one half cupfuls cooked chicken in cubes two eggs beaten one quarter cupful milk soft sifted bread crumbs crisco melt the crisco add the flour salt and pepper and stir until bubbling throughout add the broth and cream and stir until boiling add the egg and continue to stir and cook without boiling until the mixture separates a little from the saucepan add the chicken mix and turn on to a plate when cold shape roll in the crumbs cover with the eggs mixed with the milk and again roll in the crumbs when all are ready remove superfluous crumbs and fry in crisco heated until a soft bread crumb dropped into it will brown in forty seconds drain on soft paper serve at once with green peas or asparagus tips waffles two cupfuls pastry flour four teaspoonfuls baking powder three quarter teaspoonful salt two egg yolks one cupful thin cream one quarter cupful sweet milk one half cupful melted crisco three egg whites sift together the flour baking powder and salt beat the yolks add the cream and milk and stir into the dry ingredients add the crisco and whites of eggs beaten dry and beat all together thoroughly bake it once on a hot well criscoed waffle iron potatoes anna pare potatoes white or sweet and cut them lengthwise into slices one-fourth an inch in thickness carefully put the slices together to retain the original shape of the potatoes have ready wooden toothpicks covered with melted crisco run two of these through each potato to keep the slices together not too compactly soak the potatoes an hour or more in cold water let boil ten or fifteen minutes in boiling salted water then drain and set in a baking pan pour over three or four tablespoonfuls of melted crisco and let cook in the oven until tender basting each six or seven minutes with hot crisco from the pan potato patties with peas select rather long potatoes of uniform shape and size pare cut off a slice then hollow to make cups or thin shells let stand in cold water till about ready to serve then wipe dry and fry in deep hot crisco the shells should cook until tender in from six to eight minutes drain on soft paper at the oven door sprinkle the inside with a little salt and use as receptacles for cooked peas seasoned with salt sugar black pepper and butter creamed fish chicken or almost any variety of vegetable may be served in these patties the patties are to be eaten with the contents potato fritters three eggs beaten light two cupfuls mashed potato one cupful sifted pastry flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful pepper crisco for frying do not separate the whites and yolks of the eggs for beating gradually beat in the potato hot or cold then beat in the flour sifted again with the other ingredients drop by the large teaspoonful into hot crisco let cook to a golden brown turning often drain on soft paper serve with or without fish or meat fried eggplant half slices of eggplant one egg beaten light one third cupful milk soft sifted bread crumbs salt and pepper crisco for frying cut the eggplant in halves lengthwise then cut in slices half an inch in thickness and remove the purple skin sprinkle with salt and pepper dip in the egg mixed with the milk drain and pat in the crumbs turning to coat the whole surface fry two or three slices at a time the crisco is at the right heat when a crumb of soft bread browns in about sixty seconds canned pineapple fritters one egg yolk beaten light one half cupful canned grated pineapple one tablespoonful lemon juice one half teaspoon salt scant one tablespoonful sugar one half cupful and two tablespoonfuls pastry flour one half tablespoonful baking powder one egg white beaten very light crisco for frying to the egg yolk add the salt sugar lemon juice and pineapple cooked stir in the flour sifted with the baking powder 
and lastly fold in the egg white take up the mixture by tablespoonfuls and with a teaspoon scrape it into the hot crisco in a round mass turn often until done drain on soft paper dredge with powdered sugar and serve at once bananas peeled and pressed through a ricer may be used in place of the pineapple breaded halibut hearts fried have four slices of chicken halibut cut from a short distance above the tail the slices should be a generous half inch thick remove the skin and central bone to get two heart-shaped pieces from each slice beat one egg and add three tablespoonfuls of milk roll the fish in soft sifted bread crumbs and dip each in the egg to cover completely then cover again with the crumbs fry in deep hot crisco to a golden brown do not have the crisco too hot as the fish should cook about four minutes before it is colored enough for the table when right the crisco should change a crumb of bread to a golden brown in about sixty seconds serve with a cupful of mayonnaise dressing into which a few drops of onion juice and two tablespoonfuls of chili sauce or tomato ketchup have been stirred halibut cutlets one and a half cupfuls cooked fish flaked one quarter teaspoonful salt one tablespoonful lemon juice one quarter cupful crisco one teaspoonful grated onion one tablespoonful chopped green pepper one half cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one cupful fish broth or milk one egg beaten light one third cupful cream one egg three tablespoonfuls milk soft sifted bread crumbs one tablespoon finely chopped parsley crisco sprinkle the salt and lemon juice over the fish melt the crisco in it cook the onion and pepper without discoloring any of them add the flour and salt and stir and cook until frothy add the liquid and stir until boiling add the egg mixed with the cream and stir without boiling until the egg is set add the prepared fish and turn upon a dish when cold mold into one dozen cutlets roll in crumbs cover with beaten egg mixed with milk and again cover with crumbs fry in hot crisco mix the parsley with the crumbs for the final crumbing the crisco should brown a bread crumb in forty seconds fried fillets of fresh fish use any fresh fish from which strips without skin and bone may be taken scrape a little onion juice over the fish and season with salt roll in soft sifted bread crumbs beat an egg and add three tablespoonfuls of milk or water dip the egg over the pieces of fish to baste each piece completely then again roll in crumbs fry in hot crisco to a golden brown serve hot with a cupful of mayonnaise dressing to which two tablespoonfuls each of chopped capers olives pickles and parsley have been added the crisco is at the right temperature when it will brown a crumb of bread in sixty seconds inexpensive lamb cutlets breaded buy three or four pounds of the fore quarter of lamb and have it cut to get the shank in one half and the scrag or neck in the other half take the scrag half remove the shoulder blade and cut at the backbone with the cleaver to separate into cutlets steam over boiling water until tender set to press under a weight until cold dip each cutlet in an egg beaten and diluted with milk then roll in soft sifted bread crumbs and fry in hot crisco until well colored serve with string beans carrots or turnips and potatoes the crisco at using should brown a crumb of soft bread in forty seconds banana croquettes select small ripe bananas remove the peel and scrape off the coarse threads from the pulp trim off the ends to make each banana the length of a cylinder shaped croquette beat one egg and add two or three tablespoonfuls of milk roll the bananas in the egg to cover completely then roll in soft sifted bread crumbs fry in hot crisco and drain on soft paper serve as a vegetable with beef or lamb or serve with hot sweet sauce as a dessert the following sauce is appropriate currant jelly sauce boil one cupful of granulated sugar and one-third a cupful of water four or five minutes add a small glass of currant jelly and beat until smooth fried oysters that are different wash and dry the oysters dip in a beaten egg diluted with two tablespoonfuls of milk and roll in fresh grated cheese set them aside for ten minutes 
and then dip a second time in the egg after the second dipping roll in fine soft bread crumbs fry in deep crisco drain and serve with celery and rolls cutlets of lamb portuguese fashion wash and dry the oysters dip in a beaten egg diluted with two tablespoonfuls of milk and roll in fresh grated cheese set them aside for ten minutes and then dip a second time in the egg after the second dipping roll in fine soft bread crumbs fry in deep crisco drain and serve with celery and rolls cutlets of lamb portuguese fashion one cupful cold cooked lamb three slices cooked bacon three anchovies two tablespoonfuls brown sauce one half teaspoonful paprika one teaspoonful fine chopped parsley one egg beaten light one half teaspoonful salt scant one teaspoonful grated onion one egg four tablespoonfuls milk soft sifted bread crumbs crisco for frying let the meat be free from all unedible portions press this with the bacon and anchovies small fish put up in salt or oil through a food chopper add the sauce left over with the meat and other ingredients and mix all together thoroughly less salt may be needed if the anchovies are salty roll the mixture into balls and flatten these into cutlet shapes roll in flour then in egg beaten and mixed with the milk and lastly in the crumbs fry in hot crisco serve with mashed potato and tomato sauce or stewed tomatoes the crisco is right for frying the cutlets when it browns a crumb of soft bread in forty seconds cheese croquettes three tablespoonfuls crisco one-third cupful flour two-thirds cupful milk or chicken broth two egg yolks beaten light one-half cupful grated cheese one-fourth teaspoonful salt one-fourth teaspoonful paprika one cupful common cheese cut in small cubes one quarter cupful bits of pimento one egg with four tablespoons full milk soft sifted bread crumbs crisco for frying melt the crisco in it cook the flour add the liquid and stir until boiling add the egg and let cook without boiling until the egg is set stir in the grated cheese and seasonings then fold in the cubes of cheese and spread on a criscoed plate when cold shape egg and bread crumb and fry in hot crisco serve at the same time bread and a green vegetable with or without french dressing these are good with rolls and plain celery the pimentos may be omitted cheese fritters one and one half cupful scalded milk one quarter cupful starch one quarter cupful pastry flour one half teaspoonful salt one half cupful cold milk one quarter cupful crisco two egg yolks one quarter teaspoonful paprika one half to one whole cupful grated cheese one egg soft bread crumbs crisco for frying stir the cold milk flour cornstarch and salt to a smooth consistency then add to the hot milk and stir until the mixture is thick and smooth cover and let cook fifteen minutes cream the crisco beat in the yolks one at a time and stir into the hot mixture add the paprika and cheese and stir all together evenly when the cheese is melted turn the mixture into a criscoed shallow dish to make a layer from half to three-fourths an inch thick when cold cut in two inch squares or in strips three or four inches long and an inch wide cover with crumbs then with beaten egg diluted with two tablespoonfuls milk and again roll in crumbs fry in hot crisco drain on soft paper serve with a green salad or cooked fruit and bread as the hearty dish for luncheon or supper for a change use tomato puree cooked tomatoes pressed through a sieve in place of the milk salmon and potato croquettes one cup salmon or two cupfuls fresh cooked salmon two cupfuls mashed potato one half teaspoonful paprika salt as needed one egg soft sifted bread crumbs crisco for frying with a silver fork pick the fish fine add the potato and the seasonings and if at hand a very little drawn butter or cream sauce the potato may be used hot or cold but is better hot mix all together thoroughly then form into shapes of balls corks or cylinders roll in crumbs dip in the egg beaten and mixed with its bulk of milk then again in crumbs and fry in hot crisco about one minute 
sausage croquettes season two cupfuls of hot potato that has been pressed through a ricer with half a teaspoonful of salt a few grains of paprika and one or two tablespoonfuls of crisco add the beaten yolk of an egg mix and use to cover evenly some cold cooked sausages shaped by rolling on a board in same manner as croquettes dip in egg and roll in sifted bread crumbs cook in deep crisco drain on soft paper rice croquettes easter style three-quarter cupful rice three cupfuls hot milk three-quarter teaspoonful salt one quarter cupful sugar one quarter cupful crisco one egg beaten light orange marmalade one egg three tablespoonfuls milk soft bread crumbs crisco set the rice over a quick fire in a quart or more of cold water and stir until boiling let boil two minutes drain rinse in cold water and drain again cook in a double boiler with the milk and salt until the rice is tender and the milk is nearly absorbed more milk may be needed add the sugar crisco and egg mix and let cook until the egg is set turn upon a plate and when cooled a little form into egg shapes pressing a teaspoonful of marmalade or jelly into the center of each dip in egg beaten and diluted with milk then roll in crumbs and fry in hot crisco drain on soft paper serve with frothy sauce frothy sauce cream half a cupful of crisco and beat in one cupful of sugar add the beaten white of one egg when ready to use stir in half a cupful of boiling water half a teaspoonful salt one tablespoonful lemon juice and one teaspoonful vanilla extract ham croquettes one quarter cupful crisco one quarter cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful paprika one and one half cupfuls rich milk one cupful boiled rice one cupful chopped ham one egg beaten light make a sauce of the crisco flour seasonings and milk add the egg cook until it thickens but without boiling then add the rice and ham cooked mix thoroughly and turn on a dish to become cold form into balls or cylinder shapes roll in soft sifted bread crumbs then in a beaten egg diluted with three or four tablespoonfuls of milk or water and again in crumbs fry in deep crisco serve with peas stewed tomatoes or tomato salad macaroni croquettes with cheese sauce one cupful macaroni cooked tender one quarter cupful crisco one half cupful flour one teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful paprika one and one half cupfuls liquid milk and stock or tomato puree two eggs three tablespoonfuls milk or water sifted bread crumbs crisco for frying measure the macaroni after breaking in pieces cook till tender in rapidly boiling salted water drain rinse in cold water and drain again melt the crisco add the flour and seasonings and stir and cook until bubbling throughout add the liquid and stir until boiling then stir in the cooked macaroni cut into half inch rings turn on to a plate when cold shape roll in crumbs cover with the egg mixed with the liquid and again roll in crumbs when ready to cook shake off superfluous crumbs and fry in crisco drain on soft paper serve at once with cheese sauce poured over cheese sauce one quarter cupful crisco one quarter cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful paprika two cupfuls of milk one half to one whole cupful grated cheese melt the crisco in it cook the flour salt and paprika add the milk and stir until boiling add the cheese and stir until melted molasses doughnuts two and a half cupfuls flour one teaspoonful baking powder one quarter teaspoonful cinnamon three quarter teaspoonful salt one egg and one yolk beaten light one quarter cupful thick sour milk one half cupful molasses one half teaspoonful soda sift together the flour baking powder cinnamon and salt sift the soda into the sour milk and stir until it foams add to the egg with the molasses and stir into the dry ingredients a little more flour may be needed keep the mixture soft take upon the board in small portions knead slightly roll into a sheet cut into rounds and fry in hot crisco orange knots 
three tablespoonfuls crisco three-quarter cupful sugar one egg and one yolk beaten light grated rind one orange one quarter teaspoonful mace four cupfuls sifted flour one half teaspoonful salt one and one half teaspoonfuls cream of tartar one half teaspoonful soda one half cupful milk cream the crisco beat in the sugar the eggs orange rind and mace sift together the dry ingredients add the first mixture and the milk and mix to a firm dough cut off bits of the dough and roll under the fingers into strips the shape and length of a lead pencil tie in a knot or shape like an eight and fry in hot crisco drain on soft paper and dredge with confectioner's sugar swedish timbal cases three-quarter cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt two egg yolks one half cupful milk beat the yolks add the milk gradually then stir little by little into the flour and salt sifted together let the batter stand covered an hour or more before using pour part of it into a cup a little larger than the timbal iron heat the iron in the hot crisco shake off the crisco then lower the iron into the batter to not more than two-thirds its height then transfer the iron to the hot crisco and hold it there until the thin cup-shaped batter is crisp and amber-colored drain over the fat then shake from the iron on to soft pepper the finished case should be thin and crisp if soft and thick add to the batter a teaspoonful of milk a few drops at a time do not hit the bottom of the bowl either in dipping the iron or frying the case to serve fill with cooked chicken fish or vegetable as peas in cream sauce see cream chicken brown the crumb while you count thirty to test the heat of crisco potato doughnuts four and one half cupful sifted pastry flour four teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt one third nutmeg grated one half teaspoonful soda three eggs beaten light one cupful granulated sugar three tablespoonfuls melted crisco one cupful mashed potato three-fourths cupful thick sour milk sift together all the dry ingredients to the eggs add the sugar crisco mashed potato and sour milk and mix all together then stir into the dry ingredients take a little of the dough on a floured board knead slightly pat and roll into a thin sheet cut in rounds and fry in hot crisco drain on soft paper cheese fingers one quarter pound cheese grated one cupful one half cupful soft sifted bread crumbs one half teaspoonful salt one teaspoonful mustard one half teaspoonful paprika two tablespoonfuls crisco one cupful milk one egg beaten light one egg milk soft sifted bread crumbs crisco cook the cheese crumbs salt seasonings crisco and milk over hot water stirring constantly until the cheese is melted and the mixture is thickened somewhat add the egg and turn into a crisco dish of such size as will give a depth of three-fourths an inch to the mixture set the cheese in the oven in a dish of boiling water and let cook about fifteen minutes when cold cut in strips about three-fourths an inch wide and the length of the finger roll in crumbs dip in beaten egg diluted with milk roll again in crumbs and fry in hot crisco drain on soft paper serve at once with bread and a green vegetable salad or stewed fruit crullers one and one half cake compressed yeast one quarter cupful lukewarm water one cupful scalded and cooled milk one and three quarter cupfuls bread flour about one teaspoonful salt one third cupful melted crisco two eggs beaten light one cupful sugar one half teaspoonful mace or nutmeg bread flour for soft dough about four cupfuls crumble the yeast into the water mix and add to the milk then stir in the first quantity of flour more may be needed beat until smooth cover and let stand until light add the other ingredients and mix to a dough knead until smooth and elastic and set aside in a bowl brushed over on the inside with crisco until doubled in bulk turn upon a board dredged with flour and roll into a sheet about half an inch thick cut into strips about three-fourths an inch wide twist these and shape them like the figure eight let stand until light less than half an hour then fry in deep crisco 
the crisco should not be as hot as when frying doughnuts made with baking powder or similar agents as they require longer cooking for these a crumb of bread should take seventy seconds to brown sweet potato croquettes two cupfuls cooked sweet potato one half teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful cinnamon two eggs beaten light one egg beaten until well mixed two tablespoonfuls milk soft sifted bread crumbs crisco for frying the potatoes may be baked or boiled press while hot through a ricer beat the two eggs the salt and the cinnamon into the potato more salt may be needed let cool a little then roll in the hands into balls form on a board into cylinder shapes roll the shapes in the soft crumbs cover with the egg mixed with the milk and again roll in the crumbs after standing a short time roll the shapes again to remove any loose crumbs fry in hot crisco about one minute the crisco is at the proper temperature when a crumb of bread dropped into it will brown in forty seconds salt codfish balls en surprise two cupfuls raw potatoes pared and cut in quarters one cupful salt codfish in bits one half teaspoonful pepper one egg beaten light one half cupful thick white sauce one half cupful sardines in bits crisco for frying have the sardines mixed with the white sauce use one tablespoonful of crisco one and one half tablespoonfuls of flour and one half cupful of milk in making the sauce and the mixture chilled put the potatoes in a saucepan pour in boiling water nearly to cover the potatoes above and at the center of the potatoes set the fish cover and let cook until the potatoes are done drain in a large gravy strainer pick out the potato and press it through a ricer into the hot saucepan add the fish pepper and egg and beat all together thoroughly shape into balls in the hands as the codfish balls are shaped make a depression in the top of each and insert part of a teaspoonful of the sardine mixture draw the potato mixture over to enclose the filling fry in hot crisco these may be made without the sardine filling end of section five section six of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b cakes cake is classed with candy as a luxury for occasional rather than daily use expensive materials enter into the composition of cake and unless these are improved by the combination it were better to eat them as they are than to waste time and effort in combining them the two things essential to success in cake making are the mixing of the materials and the baking of the mixture one may learn to mix cakes in an hour but skill in baking cake comes only from considerable experience yet most housekeepers learn to bake cake before attempting many less difficult matters two varieties of cake are recognized sponge cake made without shortening and cup cake made with shortening a perfect sponge cake should be slightly moist very tender and filled with minute bubbles of uniform size potato flour usually sold in pound packages fine granulated sugar a clean fresh lemon and fresh laid eggs are the ingredients necessary for the choicest sponge cake potato flour thickens more than wheat flour and only half the quantity designated for wheat flour is required it makes an exceedingly delicate and tender cake a sponge cake when baked should never be brown but of a pale yellow color both without and within in mixing a shortened cake the creaming of the shortening is the first step in the process and also the most important the thorough beating of the mixture after the addition of all the ingredients but the egg whites and a short beating after the addition of the whites gives a fine grained cake if pastry flour be not at hand bread flour may be used in cake making by removing one level tablespoonful from each cupful of flour called for in the recipe the whys in cake making one why should all the ingredients and utensils to be used be assembled before beginning to mix a cake answer for best results the mixing of the batter should be a continuous process and it should be baked immediately after the addition of the flour and leavening agents two 
why cream the crisco first instead of creaming crisco and sugar together answer if both saves time and is easier requires less effort to cream the shortening first and then gradually cream the sugar into it three in cold weather why rinse the mixing bowl in warm water or leave the crisco in the room a short time before trying to cream it answer crisco as all shortening is put into a smooth creamy condition most easily when it is about the temperature of the living room or sixty eight degrees fahrenheit four for what reason do we use an earthen bowl and a slitted wooden spoon for beating sugar into shortening answer a metal bowl or spoon will discolor the sugar and shortening also a slitted spoon by presenting more surface than a solid spoon makes the work easier five why use pastry flour for cake answer cake is a luxury and should be of as delicate a texture as possible the flour is used to hold together richer articles and flour with little body or substance is desirable six why use crisco as shortening in cake answer crisco gives a very white cake of the same texture as when butter is used at half the expense seven why use fine granulated sugar in cake mixtures answer fine granulated sugar makes the best cake coarse granulated sugar gives a coarse grain cake powdered sugar a dry cake eight why beat the yolks and whites of eggs for cake separately answer whites and yolks of eggs may be beaten lighter if beaten separately a cake should be light that the digestive juices may penetrate it readily nine why beat a cake mixture lightened with baking powder or cream of tartar and soda after the addition of the stiff beaten egg whites answer if the egg whites were folded into a shortened cake mixture the cake would in spots be too porous and dry beaten in thoroughly the finished product is uniformly fine grained and tender throughout beating is the last motion given to a shortened cake mixture ten why should no motion but that of folding be used in combining a sponge cake mixture after the sugar is beaten into the yolks answer a proper sponge cake is lightened entirely by the air beaten into the eggs and the expansion of that air in baking by folding in the flour and stiff beaten whites of eggs the air beaten into the eggs is not lost by stirring the mixture the delicate air cells are broken down and the cake will be heavy eleven why should the heat of the oven be moderate when the cake mixture is set into it answer the heat of the oven should be moderate at first that there be time for the formation of the bubbles of gas which are to lighten it if the oven be too hot the outside is cooked before the gas is fully evolved then when the gas is formed it breaks out at the weakest spot or if the oven be very hot the cake will be heavy having baked before it has had time to rise to its full height twelve why does a cake batter in baking sometimes rise high in the middle crack open and run out answer usually the above condition is occasioned by too hot an oven at first the heat browns and crusts over the top of the cake before it is penetrated to the center later on when the heat reaches the center the bubbles of gas formed will burst out at the weakest point thirteen when is stronger heat needed after the cake is risen at the beginning of the baking or at the last of the baking answer strong heat is needed after the cake has risen to make the cell walls firm enough to stand up in the first quarter of the time of baking the cake should rise to its full height in the second quarter it should brown over in spots in the third quarter brown all over and in the last quarter dry off and settle in the pan as the baking is practically done before the last quarter is reached the heat may be gradually lessened during this period fourteen why is it that it is not advisable to move a cake in the oven during the second and third quarters of baking answer when a cake is risen to its full height and the cell walls have not become fixed by heat the jar of moving will cause them to fall or settle and as the leavening agents have done their work no more gas can be evolved to send up the cake 
and consequently it will be heavy. 15. Why should the oven door be opened and shut with care while a cake is in the oven? Answer. If the oven door be slammed shut hard, the jar might cause the cake to fall. The oven door may be opened a reasonable number of times during the baking of a cake, if it be opened and shut gently. In all ovens except the electric, the heat of the oven must be regulated by opening the door often and noting the appearance of the cake. 16. Why is a cake when baked sometimes crisp, rough, and uneven on the edges? Answer. A cake in which all the ingredients are properly proportioned is smooth on the edges. The opposite condition is usually due to too much sugar or shortening or too little flour. There must be flour enough to combine with all the sugar and shortening used. Otherwise, the excess in sugar and shortening will be found cooked together on the edges. 17. Why is it of no use to add flavoring extracts to a cake mixture? Answer. The volatile extracts are dissipated in baking. Grated rind of an orange or lemon may be used in certain cakes. In other cakes, add extracts to frostings and fillings when they are cold and flavor the cake in this way. 18. Why are cakes made with either yolks of eggs or molasses baked in a cooler oven than cakes with whites of eggs and sugar? Answer. Yolks of eggs contain a large proportion of fat. Both fat and molasses burn easily, and the temperature of the oven must be regulated accordingly. 19. Why wash down with tips of fingers or cloth wet in cold water the inside of the saucepan in which sugar and water are being cooked for boiled frosting? Answer. Water is used on the inside of the saucepan to remove grains of sugar, which if left would make the frosting grainy. To obviate this still more, cover the saucepan while the sugar boils three or four minutes to steam and melt any grains of sugar thrown up in cooking then uncover and let boil undisturbed to the right degree twenty why not beat the eggs for frosting or for a cake mixture some time in advance of use answer whites of eggs beaten stiff will liquefy on standing and cannot again be beaten light they will make neither satisfactory cake nor frosting twenty one why not beat the whites of eggs for the cake and then a little later use the egg beater without washing to beat whites of eggs for frosting answer whites of eggs except on the rarest occasions cannot be beaten light unless the egg beater be absolutely clean and dry twenty two why should a pan in which cake containing shortening is to be baked be lined with a strip of criscoed paper the exact width of the pan and with ends hanging over answer the cake when baked and cooled slightly may be lifted in perfect shape from the pan by the ends of paper also if the cake should be burned slightly on the bottom this portion may be removed with the paper to which it will adhere a burned surface may also be removed from a cake with a lemon grater after which the surface should be brushed with a clean whisk broom kept for the purpose 23. Why bake a sponge cake in an ungreased pan? Answer. A sponge cake properly made, without shortening, and baked will adhere to an ungreased surface. Then when baked it may be turned upside down and the cell walls will be elongated while the cake hung from the bottom of the tins is drying out and cooling. 24. Why set some cookie and ginger snap mixtures aside to chill before rolling and cutting into shape answer mixtures that are to be rolled may be handled when mixed quite soft with but little flour if the mixture be first hardened by chilling directions or recipes for cookies etc say flour for a soft dough the smaller the quantity of flour as a general rule the richer and better are cookies and ginger snaps an expert can handle a softer dough than an amateur by chilling the mixture it stiffens and can be handled without the use of so much flour emily's white cake one half cupful crisco one and one half cupful sugar three cupfuls flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt one cupful water one teaspoonful flavoring 
whites of three eggs cream crisco add sugar slowly and cream together sift dry ingredients and add alternately with the liquid add flavoring beat mixture thoroughly and last fold in stiffly beaten whites of eggs prepare layer cake tins by greasing them with a mixture of crisco and flour pour in cake mixture put in moderate oven allow to rise for five minutes increase heat to bake at the end of fifteen minutes reduce heat to allow cake to shrink from the pan entire time for baking twenty minutes kate b vaughn chocolate frosting one cupful granulated sugar one cupful boiling water six squares chocolate confectioner's sugar as needed one teaspoonful vanilla extract melt the sugar in the boiling water cover and let boil three or four minutes add the chocolate broken in pieces and let melt over boiling water then beat in the sugar sifted and the extract use sugar to make the frosting of a consistency to spread and not run from the cake if it becomes too stiff before it is spread add boiling water or syrup a few drops at a time things to remember in connection with these recipes when cake is not a success it is not the fault of the crisco either too much was used the oven heat not perfectly controlled or some important ingredient was used in the wrong proportion crisco should be creamed with the sugar more thoroughly than butter as crisco contains no moisture to dissolve the sugar atlantics one egg yolk one half cupful crisco melted one half cupful molasses one half cupful boiling water one teaspoonful soda one tablespoonful ginger one half teaspoonful salt two and one half cupful sifted flour about frosting one cupful sugar four tablespoonfuls boiling water one egg white twelve fresh marshmallows one teaspoonful vanilla coconut if desired beat the egg yolk and add it to the crisco molasses and water sift the soda ginger salt and flour into the first ingredients and mix thoroughly let chill in the refrigerator then roll into a sheet and cut into rounds bake in a moderate oven more flour may be needed the cake should not spread in cooking but should be as soft as possible for the frosting dissolve the sugar in the boiling water with the tips of the fingers wet repeatedly in cold water wash down the sides of the pan cover and let the syrup boil three minutes uncover and let boil until when tested in cold water a soft ball may be formed with the thermometer cooked to two hundred thirty eight degrees or two hundred forty degrees fahrenheit pour the syrup in a fine stream on the white of egg beaten dry beating constantly meanwhile when all the syrup has been added to the egg add the marshmallows beat with a spoon until melted then beat with an egg beater until very light adding the vanilla meanwhile then spread on the top of the cakes coconut may be added if desired jelly roll two eggs beaten light one cupful granulated sugar grated rind one lemon one third cupful hot water one tablespoonful crisco one cupful flour one and one half teaspoonfuls baking powder one quarter teaspoonful salt currant jelly confectioner's sugar gradually beat the sugar into the eggs add the grated rind the crisco melted in the hot water and the flour sifted with the baking powder and salt beat all together thoroughly and turn into a shallow pan lined with a well criscoed paper bake about eighteen minutes turn it once onto a clean cloth trim off the crisp edges on the four sides spread with jelly and roll over and over keeping the cloth between the fingers and the cake roll the roll of cake in the cloth when ready to serve sift confectioner sugar over the top of the cake orange gold cake one quarter cupful crisco one half cupful sugar four egg yolks grated rind one orange one third teaspoonful salt one quarter cupful milk one cupful sifted flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder frosting one cupful sugar one quarter cupful boiling water two egg whites one half teaspoonful orange extract one quarter teaspoonful almond extract cream the crisco 
Beat in the sugar, the yolks, beaten light, the grated rind and salt, and alternately the milk and the flour sifted with the baking powder. Bake in a round Criscoed pan, seven inches in diameter, about twenty minutes. When the cake is cold, invert it and cover the surface with the frosting. Melt the sugar in the water, wash down the inside of the pan, cover and let cook three or four minutes, then uncover and let cook until a soft ball may be formed when the syrup is tested in cold water. Pour, in a fine stream, on the whites of eggs beaten very light, beating constantly meanwhile. Continue to beat until cold. Add the flavoring and use as above. Recipes Fudge Cake One half cupful Crisco One cupful granulated sugar Three eggs beaten light Four ounces chocolate Three tablespoonfuls sugar Three tablespoonfuls hot milk One half cupful milk One and one half cupfuls flour Three teaspoonfuls baking powder One half teaspoonful cinnamon Cream the Crisco Gradually beat in the sugar Then the eggs beaten light Melt the chocolate over hot water, add the small measure of sugar and the hot milk, and mix thoroughly. Then beat into the first mixture. Lastly, add, alternately, the milk and the flour, sifted with the baking powder and cinnamon. Bake in two layers, about 18 minutes, or in a sheet, about 25 minutes. Baked in layers, put soft filling between them, frosting on top. Frosting for fudge cake two cupfuls granulated sugar three tablespoonfuls molasses or caramel syrup one half cupful boiling water one teaspoonful crisco two egg whites melt the sugar in the molasses and boiling water wash down the saucepan cover and let boil about four minutes uncover add the crisco and let boil to the soft ball stage two hundred thirty eight degrees fahrenheit pour the syrup in a fine stream on the egg whites beaten very light, beating constantly meanwhile. Pour the frosting into the saucepan in which the syrup was boiled. Set it over a dull fire on an asbestos mat or over boiling water, and stir and beat until it thickens perceptibly. Then spread on the cake, leaving the surface rough. Soft filling. Two cupfuls brown sugar, one half cupful sweet milk, one tablespoonful Crisco, two tablespoonfuls flour, one quarter teaspoonful salt, one tablespoonful vanilla. Melt the sugar in the milk and heat to the boiling point. Cream the Crisco, beat in the flour and salt, and dilute with a little of the hot syrup. Stir until boiling, then let simmer, stirring occasionally. Ten minutes, add the vanilla, let cool a little, and use. Mocha cake. One half cupful Crisco, one and one half cupful sugar three eggs beaten without separating three cupfuls flour four teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt one cup milk cream the crisco and beat in half the sugar gradually beat the rest of the sugar into the beaten eggs and beat the two mixtures together sift together the flour baking powder and salt and add to the egg crisco mixture alternately with the milk bake in three layers about eighteen minutes or in a large sheet about 25 minutes. Use mocha frosting between the layers and on top of the layer cakes, or over the bottom of the inverted sheet of cake. Sprinkle the frosting with one cupful of chopped pecan nut meats. Mocha frosting. One half cupful Crisco, one and one half cupful sifted confectioner sugar, one quarter teaspoonful salt, about one quarter cupful very black coffee or coffee extract two squares melted chocolate if desired cream the crisco beat in the sugar gradually add the salt and beat in the coffee a few drops at a time then the chocolate if used fruit and nut cake one half cupful crisco one cupful sugar one cupful citron raisins and nuts chopped fine three eggs beaten light one cupful milk three cupfuls flour four teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt cream the crisco gradually beat in the sugar then the fruit and nuts the eggs and alternately the milk and the flour sifted with the baking powder and salt bake in a pan eight by twelve inches lined with a criscoed paper sift two tablespoonfuls of granulated sugar 
over the top of the cake before baking lemon cake one quarter cupful crisco one cupful sugar two eggs beaten light one half cupful milk one and one half cupfuls flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt cream the crisco beat in the sugar and eggs then alternately the milk and flour sifted with the baking powder and salt bake the cake in two layers put the filling between the layers and sift confectioner sugar over the top filling one egg beaten light one lemon grated rind and juice one cupful sugar two tablespoonfuls crisco put all the ingredients into a double boiler stir and cook until the mixture thickens lemon citron cake one half cupful crisco one and one half cupful sugar two egg yolks beaten light grated rind one half lemon one half cupful milk one half teaspoonful salt two cupfuls flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder three egg whites beaten dry two ounces citron cream the crisco beat half the sugar into the crisco the other half into the yolks then beat the two together add the lemon rind and alternately the milk and the salt flour and baking powder sifted together lastly the whites of eggs when putting the cake into the pan add the citron here and there bake in a round tube pan about forty five minutes or in a biscuit pan about thirty minutes oatmeal macaroons one egg beaten light one half cupful sugar one half tablespoonful melted crisco one half teaspoonful salt scant one and one quarter cupfuls rolled oats beat the sugar into the egg add the crisco salt and rolled oats and mix all together thoroughly shape in small rounds on a criscoed baking sheet bake in a moderate oven the recipe makes eighteen cakes denver or high altitude cake one half cupful crisco less one tablespoonful one cupful sugar one half cupful milk two cupfuls pastry flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder three egg whites beaten dry cream the crisco and gradually beat in the sugar add the flour sifted with the baking powder alternately with the milk then the whites of eggs beat vigorously and turn into three layer cake pans bake about twenty minutes put the layers together and cover the outside of the cake with chocolate frosting by using a boiled frosting white in which chopped raisins nuts and figs are beaten a good lady baltimore cake results chocolate frosting two squares or ounces chocolate one and one half cupfuls granulated sugar one half cupful milk two egg whites beaten very light one half teaspoonful vanilla extract melt the chocolate over hot water add three tablespoonfuls each of the sugar and milk and stir and cook until smooth and boiling then add the rest of the sugar and milk and cook until a little dropped into cold water may be gathered into a rather firm soft ball two hundred forty degrees fahrenheit at sea level two hundred twenty degrees fahrenheit high altitude on the sugar thermometer pour the syrup in a fine stream on the egg whites beating constantly meanwhile add the vanilla and use as soon as the frosting will remain in place jelly cake one half cupful crisco one and one quarter cupful sugar two egg yolks beaten light one half cupful milk two cupfuls flour two and one half teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one egg white beaten dry cream the crisco beat in the sugar and the yolks then alternately the milk and the flour sifted with the baking powder and salt and lastly the white of egg beat vigorously bake in two layer cake pans about fifteen minutes put the layers together with fruit jelly and cover top and sides with confectioner's egg frosting to the leftover white of egg add half a teaspoonful of orange extract and the juice of half a lemon or two tablespoonfuls of cream water may be used and stir in sifted confectioner's sugar to make a frosting that will not run from the cake favorite high altitude cake one half cupful crisco four egg yolks beaten light one and one half cupfuls granulated sugar three quarter cupful milk or water three cupfuls pastry flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt four egg whites beaten very light 
cream the crisco gradually beat half the sugar into the crisco and half into the beaten yolks then beat the two mixtures together add alternately the liquid and the flour sifted with the baking powder and salt and lastly the whites of eggs bake in three layer cake pans put the layers together with soft filling and sift confectioner's sugar over the top this cake may also be made successful at sea level here it is close-grained but tender mocha frosting is particularly appropriate for frosting lord baltimore cake one half cupful crisco one cupful sugar three egg yolks beaten light one quarter cupful milk one quarter cupful water two cupfuls flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder three egg whites beaten dry cream the crisco gradually beat in the sugar the yolks and alternately the milk and water with the flour and baking powder sifted together beat in the whites of the eggs bake in three layer pans about eighteen minutes put the layers together and cover the outside with the following frosting frosting for lord baltimore cake one and one half cupfuls granulated sugar one half cupful boiling water two egg whites beaten dry one half cupful macaroon crumbs one half cupful nut meats chopped one third cupful candied cherries cut fine one half teaspoonful vanilla extract one half teaspoonful orange extract melt the sugar in the water wash down the inside of the saucepan with the tips of the fingers wet repeatedly in cold water cover and let cook about three minutes uncover and cook until soft ball may be formed in cold water two hundred thirty eight degrees fahrenheit pour in a fine stream on the egg whites beating constantly meanwhile add the other ingredients and beat until the mixture will hold its shape coconut and chocolate jumbles one half cupful crisco one cupful sugar two tablespoonfuls milk two eggs beaten light two and one half cupfuls pastry flour one teaspoonful salt two teaspoonfuls baking powder one cupful coconut grated rind one lemon two squares chocolate melted one half teaspoonful cinnamon cream the crisco and beat in the sugar milk eggs and flour sifted with the salt and baking powder divide the dough and add the coconut and lemon rind to one half the chocolate and cinnamon to the other half add flour as needed to make a dough that may be rolled into a sheet cut out with a doughnut cutter dredge with sugar and bake if preferred omit the lemon rind and use all the ingredients in one mixture but cakes of two colors are attractive ribbon cake one cupful crisco less two tablespoonfuls two and a half cupfuls sugar four eggs one cupful milk four cupfuls and two tablespoonfuls flour four and a half teaspoonfuls baking powder one cupful currants chopped one and one half cupfuls raisins chopped one quarter pound citron chopped two teaspoonfuls molasses cream the crisco beat in the sugar the eggs beaten without separating the whites and the yolks and alternately the milk and flour sifted with the baking powder bake two-thirds of the mixture in two layer cake pans to the other third add the fruit and molasses and bake in a pan of same size and shape as those used for the other two layers use the layer with fruit for the middle layer of the cake put the layers together with fruit jelly and cover the top with icing newport cake seven eighths cupful crisco one and one half cupful sifted pastry flour one teaspoonful baking powder three quarter teaspoonful salt five egg yolks one and one half cupful sifted powdered sugar grated rind one lemon or orange five egg whites beaten dry one tablespoonful milk cream the crisco gradually beat it into the flour sift it again with the baking powder and salt beat the yolks until thick and lemon colored then gradually beat the sugar into them gradually beat the yolks and sugar with grated rind into the crisco and flour mixture lastly beat in the whites of eggs and the milk bake in a loaf one hour in a sheet about forty five minutes the heat of the oven should be moderate especially at first the cake is very fine grained tender and delicate cover with any white frosting flavored with half a teaspoonful each of orange and lemon extract 
gala cake one half cupful crisco three whole eggs beaten light one cupful sugar three cupfuls flour four teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one cupful milk cream the crisco gradually beat half the sugar into the crisco and half into the eggs do not separate the eggs then beat the two mixtures together sift together the flour baking powder and salt and add to the first mixture alternately with the milk bake in a well criscoed pan eleven by eight inches about half an hour invert the cake on a wire cooler and when nearly cold spread the bottom top when inverted with gala frosting four tablespoonfuls molasses two cupfuls granulated sugar one half cupful boiling water two egg whites beaten stiff one half teaspoonful vanilla extract stir the molasses sugar and water until the sugar is dissolved with the tips of the fingers and wet repeatedly in cold water wash down the inside of the saucepan cover and let boil three or four minutes uncover and let boil until a little of the syrup may be gathered into a soft ball when tested in cold water or to two hundred thirty eight degrees fahrenheit on the sugar thermometer turn in a fine stream on the egg whites beating constantly meanwhile return the frosting to the fire over boiling water or on an asbestos mat and beat constantly until it thickens a little then spread over the cake leaving the surface rough spiced ginger layer cake one third cupful crisco one half cupful sugar one half cupful molasses one cupful sour milk thick one and three quarter cupfuls pastry flour one teaspoonful soda one half teaspoonful salt scant one teaspoonful cinnamon one teaspoonful ginger fruit jelly one cupful cream whipped two tablespoonfuls sugar beat the crisco to a cream and gradually beat in the sugar and molasses sift together the flour soda salt cinnamon and ginger and add to the first mixture alternately with the sour milk beat all together thoroughly bake in two layer cake pans put the layers together with jelly between and spread the cream whipped and mixed with the sugar on top chopped nuts may be sprinkled over the cream roxbury nut cakes one quarter cupful crisco one half cupful sugar two egg yolks one half cupful molasses one half cupful thick sour milk one and one half cupfuls pastry flour one teaspoonful cinnamon one half teaspoonful cloves one teaspoonful soda two egg whites beaten very light one cupful nut meats chopped cream the crisco and beat in the sugar yolks molasses and sour milk beat in the dry ingredients sifted together then the egg whites and nuts bake in eighteen small tins frost or not as desired date cookies one half cupful crisco one cupful sugar one egg beaten light grated rind one lemon or orange one half cupful milk three cupfuls flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one half pound dates two tablespoonfuls sugar cream the crisco and gradually beat in the sugar add the egg and grated rind sift together the flour baking powder and salt and add to the first mixture alternately with the milk chill the dough if convenient more flour may be needed the cookie should not spread in baking take the dough on to a floured board a little at a time knead slightly roll thin and cut in rounds lift half the rounds to a baking sheet spread with the stone dates cooked with the sugar and chopped brush the edge with water cover with the other half of the cakes pressing the edges together closely dredge with granulated sugar bake in a moderate oven figs or canned pineapple grated may be used in place of the dates ginger snaps one cupful crisco one cupful molasses one cupful brown sugar one egg beaten light one tablespoonful ginger one half teaspoonful salt one teaspoonful soda flour as needed put the crisco molasses and sugar over the fire to melt the crisco and sugar then let boil about six minutes after boiling begins when cooled somewhat lukewarm add the egg with the ginger salt soda and three cupfuls of flour sifted together stir to a dough adding flour as required knead on a board 
roll into a thin sheet cut into rounds and bake in a moderate oven let the first three ingredients boil until a little of the mixture dropped into cold water may be gathered into a soft ball plain cake one quarter cupful crisco three quarter cupful sugar two eggs one half cupful milk one and one half cupfuls flour one quarter teaspoonful salt two teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful cinnamon three tablespoonfuls sugar beat the crisco to a cream then gradually beat in the sugar add the eggs beaten light without spreading the whites and yolks sift together the flour salt and baking powder and add to the first mixture alternately with the milk turn into a pan about eight by nine inches mix the sugar and cinnamon and sift it over the top of the cake bake about eighteen minutes lady baltimore cake one half cupful crisco one and one half cupful sugar three quarter cupful water two and one half cupfuls flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt four egg whites beaten stiff cream the crisco gradually beat in the sugar alternating at the last with some of the water sift the dry ingredients and add alternately with the rest of the water beat the mixture until smooth add the whites of the eggs and beat thoroughly bake in three well criscoed layer cake pans about eighteen minutes put the layers together and cover the outside with the following frosting frosting for lady baltimore cake three cupfuls granulated sugar one cupful boiling water three egg whites beaten stiff one cupful chopped raisins one cupful chopped nut meats five figs cut in bits one half teaspoonful vanilla extract one third teaspoonful rose extract one third teaspoonful lemon extract melt the sugar in the water cover and let boil until a soft ball may be formed in cold water pour in a fine stream on the egg whites beating constantly meanwhile add the fruit nuts and flavoring and beat until cool enough to use white fig cake one half cupful crisco one cupful sugar one quarter cupful milk one and one half cupfuls flour one quarter teaspoonful salt two teaspoonfuls baking powder four egg whites six figs three tablespoonfuls sugar beat the crisco to a cream and gradually beat in the sugar sift together the flour salt and baking powder and add to the crisco mixture alternately with the milk lastly add the whites of eggs beaten very light and beat vigorously bake in two small layer cake pans about fifteen minutes cook five or six figs in boiling water until the figs are tender and the water well evaporated chop fine add three tablespoonfuls of sugar and stir until boiling then use as a filling between the two layers mix a cupful and a half of sifted confectioner's sugar with a little boiling water about three tablespoonfuls and half a teaspoonful of orange extract and spread over the top of the cake soft molasses cookies one cupful melted crisco one and one third cupfuls molasses one cupful brown sugar one cupful thick sour milk one teaspoonful vinegar one egg beaten light five cupfuls flour two teaspoonfuls soda one tablespoonful ginger one tablespoonful cinnamon one teaspoonful salt put the liquid ingredients into a bowl sift the soda into the flour add the salt and spices and sift all together into the liquid mixture keep the dough as soft as can be handled roll out cut in thick cookies and bake in a quick oven by chilling the mixture overnight less flour will be needed End of section 6section seven of the whys of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b pastry pastry is a stiff dough made with a large proportion of shortening pastry should be light or flaky and friable rather than porous and soft all varieties of pastry may be included under the terms plain and flaky pastry in plain pastry the shortening is mixed evenly throughout the flour in flaky pastry either dough or plain pastry is combined with shortening in layers or flakes the starch and shortening combined in pastry 
are an acknowledged source of muscular energy and those who exercise freely in the open air will find no trouble in digesting well-made and well-baked pastry good pastry being tender and friable is easily masticated it is the half-cooked liquid-soaked undercrust of pies made by careless cooks that has brought pastry into disrepute fat makes a tender crust and plentiful shortening is the first requisite for good pastry puff paste in which equal weights of flour and shortening are used is more digestible than pastry with a scant proportion of fat and a large proportion of water pies are the form in which pastry is commonly most acceptable with these it does not suffice to use the proper proportion of ingredients and to combine them correctly much depends on the manner of putting the paste and filling together and the baking there is moisture in all pie fillings and if the filling be left to stand on the lower paste before baking or if the oven be not hot enough to bake the lower paste before it becomes saturated with moisture a tough crust will result the inference is obvious avoid putting a pie together until the upper crust has been rolled and made ready to set in place and the oven has been heated to bake it custard pie plain pastry four eggs three-quarter cupful sugar one half teaspoonful salt two and one half cupfuls rich milk nutmeg trim the sheet of paste to extend beyond the plate three-fourths an inch on all sides roll over the paste to meet the edge of the plate flute this double fold of paste with the thumbs and finger and press each fluting down upon the edge of the plate in setting the paste on the plate press out all air from below beat the eggs add the sugar and salt and beat again add the milk mix thoroughly and turn into the prepared plate set to cook in a hot oven lowering the heat after a few minutes that the custard be not overcooked when puffy and firm the pie is baked grate a little nutmeg over the top and chill before serving for plain pastry see page sixty six strawberry shortcake two and one half cupfuls pastry flour five teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one third cupful crisco one cupful milk about butter two baskets strawberries one and one half cupfuls granulated sugar whipped cream sugar sift together the flour baking powder and salt with two knives or the tips of the fingers work in the crisco then use milk as needed to mix to a soft dough with a spoon spread the dough in two well criscoed cake pans bake about fifteen minutes turn one cake on a large chop plate spread the bottom with butter cover with strawberries mixed with the sugar set the second cake above the berries spread this with butter and the rest of the berries serve with or without cream this recipe may be used for fresh raspberries blackberries or peaches or for canned apricots to prepare the strawberries hull wash and drain them leave a few choice berries whole cut the rest in halves mix with the sugar more sugar may be needed and let stand half an hour or longer sift confectioner's sugar over the top of the finished cake and set the whole berries above in a symmetrical order whys of pastry one why use pastry flour answer pastry flour absorbs a comparatively small measure of water and thus is well adapted to pastry making two why use a small quantity of water answer fat and flour the main ingredients in pastry used alone make a crumbly mixture that cannot be handled just enough water should be used to render the flour and shortening smooth and pliable three why have the ingredients for pastry cold answer warm shortening absorbs the flour forming a dense mixture in which no air is entangled with cold shortening air will separate the particles of fat and flour cold rather than warm water will aid in keeping in the air the heat of the oven expands the air and makes the pastry light four why cut the shortening into the flour with two knives answer the warmth of the fingers acts upon the pastry in the same manner as warmth in the air and shortening with two knives the work may be done in less time than with one five why does pastry clean the bowl when just the right quantity of water has been added to the mixture answer 
as the mixture is cut and turned over with the knife against the sides of the bowl it will clean the bowl when just enough liquid has been added to take up all the flour if more liquid be added than the flour will absorb the remedy is to cut a tablespoonful of shortening into three or four tablespoonfuls of flour and then cut enough of this into the first mixture to put the mass into a condition to clean or wipe out the bowl six why handle pastry lightly and as little as possible answer in handling pastry or turning it over air escapes also as the paste softens on exposure to the heat of the room flour must be added for which no shortening has been taken and the loss of air and excess of flour will make the finished pastry tough and heavy seven why not mix the shortening too thoroughly into the flour answer the object is to incorporate air spaces that expansion of air when heated may make the pastry light eight why is pastry sometimes grainy and crumbly answer pastry is grainy and crumbly either when the shortening and flour are mixed together too thoroughly or too little water is used to make a smooth mixture or for both these reasons nine why cover pastry close and let stand some hours in a cool place before shaping and baking answer by standing the moisture acts on the gluten in the flour and brings out its elasticity rendering it easy to roll or stretch the paste into a thin sheet pastry is covered to exclude the air which would dry it upon the outside it is kept in a cool place to keep the enclosed air cool ten why roll pastry with a light rather than a firm and heavy motion answer pastry is rolled with a light motion that the air may not be pressed from it eleven why be careful that pastry does not stick to the board answer if pastry sticks to the board it cannot be lifted and set upon the utensil on which it is to be baked it has to be put into the shape again which is objectionable twelve why note that the paste slips on the board answer as long as the paste slips on the board it is not sticking to it the moment it begins to adhere it may be lifted on the sides of the forefingers and drawn to a place where there will be a sprinkling of flour between it and the board thirteen why is the sprinkling of flour needed answer the paste sticks to the board at the point where it is moist if there be a little more flour on the board than the moisture will absorb the paste may be rolled out without much handling. 14. Why use a magic cover in making pastry? Answer. A soft paste is less likely to stick to a magic cover than to any other surface. A magic cover is a square of duck used in place of a board and a firm stockinette cover that is drawn over the rolling pin. 15. Why is some pastry tough? Answer. If pastry is to be tender or short, plenty of fat must be used flour and water make a tough mixture a tender paste is not possible unless shortening equal to half the weight of the flour be used sixteen why in putting a pie together brush over the edge of the lower crust with cold water answer the cold water causes the edges of the two crusts to adhere and make a close joint to keep in the filling seventeen why perforate the upper crust answer the upper crust is perforated to provide an exit for the steam from the cooking filling if no opening be provided the steam would burst out at the weakest place usually at the edge where the two pieces of pastry come together not only steam but filling will escape eighteen why have the paste for a pie lie loosely over the plate and again loosely over the filling answer pastry shrinks in cooking and if it is to enclose and keep in the filling allowance must be made for this shrinkage nineteen why does pastry shrink answer in flour as in all organic substances water is in composition the water in flour is changed to steam which is driven off in baking this loss of water reduces the size of the finished product a cake or a loaf of bread as well as pastry shrinks from the sides of the pan when done shrinkage is a test by which the extent of cooking may be determined twenty why bake the pastry for some pies as lemon before putting in the filling 
answer by baking the pastry before the filling is put in place it may be baked thoroughly and a liquid soaked crust be avoided twenty one why bake the shell or under crust of pies on the outside of the pan answer pastry baked on the inverted pan in which it is to be set gives the right shape for the pan twenty two why is this method of baking pies not in more general use answer when well cooked a pie tastes better when filling and pastry are baked together nor is the method adapted to f all kinds of pies some plates as glassware heat so quickly that with a very little care no pie baked in them should be served with other than a digestible lower crust twenty three why set pastry to bake in a hot oven answer a pie is set to cook in a hot oven that the under crust may be baked before it becomes soaked with liquid from the filling twenty four if pastry be properly made why should it be heavy in case it be a little under baked answer the walls of the air cells must be thoroughly stiffened by the heat of the oven in other words the pastry must be thoroughly baked or when removed from the heat the oven the cell walls will collapse and form a heavy mass twenty five why does fruit run out of a pie in baking answer sometimes the perforations in the upper crust become clogged with filling or the edges cook together and steam cannot escape through them sometimes the pie cooks so fast that more steam is formed than can escape through the openings and new openings are made at the weakest places twenty six why is pastry considered indigestible answer pastry that is not properly made and baked is apt to be heavy and dense and the digestive fluids cannot penetrate it easily good pastry eaten occasionally by people in health is not to be considered indigestible twenty seven why is crisco a good shortening for pastry answer as crisco melts at a lower degree of temperature than that of the human body and is also a pure vegetable fat it is comparatively easy of digestion also being practically tasteless the flavors of the fruit or other delicate products combined with the pastry are not lost twenty eight why not eat pastry at the end of a hearty meal answer too large a quantity of fat cannot be readily and perfectly digested it is more hygienic to close a meal in which for instance a fat roast of meat rich sauces and vegetables dressed with butter are served with a light sweet lacking in fat recipes plain pastry one and one half cupfuls flour one teaspoonful salt one half cupful crisco four to six tablespoonfuls cold water sift flour and salt and cut crisco into flour with knife until finely divided fingertips may be used to finish blending materials add gradually sufficient water to make stiff paste water should be added sparingly and mixed with knife through dry ingredients form lightly and quickly into dough roll out on slightly floured board about one quarter inch thick use light motion in handling rolling pin and roll from center outward sufficient for one small pie flaky pastry two cupfuls pastry flour one half teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful baking powder one half cupful crisco one third cupful or more cold water three or four level tablespoonfuls crisco creamed use the above ingredients except the creamed crisco as in making plain pastry roll the pastry into a thin rectangular sheet on half of the paste set part of the cream crisco in small bits equally distant one from another fold the other half of the paste over the crisco put the rest of the crisco on half of this surface in the same manner as before and again fold half of the paste over the crisco pat the paste with the pin then roll into a long strip fold the strip three times to make three layers of paste turn the paste halfway round that it may not be rolled in the same direction as before and roll into a thin sheet the rolling and folding may be repeated three or four times if desired this paste is used for tarts little pies and the upper crust of larger pies rhubarb pie one cupful chopped rhubarb one egg beaten light one cupful sugar one cracker rolled into crumbs one tablespoonful crisco one quarter teaspoonful salt 
mix all the ingredients together bake between two crusts use a rather small pie plate butterscotch pie one half recipe for flaky pastry three tablespoonfuls cornstarch one quarter teaspoonful salt one half cupful cold milk one cupful milk scalded two tablespoonfuls crisco one cupful brown sugar two egg yolks meringue two egg whites one quarter cupful granulated sugar bake the pastry rolled as for pie crust on the outside of an inverted pie pan prick the paste all over and set the pie pan on a tin sheet to keep the edge from contact with the oven when baked set inside a clean pie plate turn in the cooked filling cover with the meringue and let bake about ten minutes to make the filling cook the cornstarch and salt mixed with the cold milk in the hot milk fifteen minutes add the crisco and sugar stirred and cooked over the fire until the sugar is dissolved and bubbly add the yolks for the meringue beat the whites very light and gradually beat in the sugar english apple pie one half recipe flaky pastry apples three quarter cupful sugar one half teaspoonful salt grating of nutmeg or lemon rind two teaspoonfuls of crisco two to three tablespoonfuls water rub over the inside of a deep pie plate with crisco and slice pared apples into it to fill rather high sprinkle on the sugar salt and nutmeg add the crisco in bits here and there and pour on the water roll the paste into a round to fit the plate cut slits in the paste and spread it over the apple pressing it on the edge of the dish bake about forty minutes serve with or without cream berry pie recipe for plain pastry two tablespoonfuls crisco one generous pint berries one cupful sugar one tablespoonful flour one half teaspoonful salt line the plate with part of the plain pastry letting it emerge one quarter inch beyond the plate roll the rest of the pastry into a thin sheet spread one half with one tablespoonful of the crisco and fold the other half of the paste over the crisco spread the other tablespoonful of crisco over half of this paste and fold to cover the shortening pat and roll into a long strip fold three times and roll to fit the lower paste make a few slits in the center turn the berries and other ingredients into the pastry lined plate brush the edge with cold water set the second piece of paste in place pressing the edges close together set to bake in an oven hot on the bottom takes about half an hour new england cream tart pie two cupfuls dry applesauce two cupfuls cream three egg yolks well beaten one half a nutmeg grated sugar as desired one half teaspoonful salt three egg whites beaten dry one third cupful granulated sugar spitzenberg apples are considered the best for this pie but other tart apples may be used press the apples cooked with as little water as possible through a sieve add the cream and stir into the yolks mixed with the nutmeg salt and sugar about one cupful of sugar is plenty have ready a pastry shell baked over an inverted pie plate set the shell inside the plate pour in the filling and set into a moderate oven to cook the filling beat the sugar into the beaten egg whites and spread over the pie cooled somewhat and returned to the oven to cook the meringue it should take from ten to fifteen minutes the filling may also be baked in a pastry lined plate as is a squash or custard pie prune pie use plain pastry for the under crust roll the rest of the pastry into a sheet add bits of crisco here and there to cover one half the paste and fold to cover the crisco add more crisco in bits and fold to cover it pat and roll into a sheet fold to make three layers and roll to fit the plate for the upper crust of the pie filling for prune pie three-quarter pound cooked prunes stoned one cupful sugar juice of half lemon two tablespoonfuls flour prune juice as needed one tablespoonful crisco in bits one half teaspoonful salt put the prunes into the pastry lined plate add the other ingredients two tablespoonfuls of orange marmalade may replace the lemon juice and brush the edge of the paste with cold water set the upper paste in place trim as needed and brush the edges together with cold water bake about half an hour open cranberry pie or cranberry tart 
spread a round of flaky paste over an inverted pie plate prick the paste with a fork here and there over the sides as well as the top bake until done remove the paste from the plate wash the plate and set the pastry inside turn a cooked filling into the pastry shell and set figures cut from pastry and bake above the filling cooked cranberry filling two level tablespoonfuls cornstarch one half teaspoonful salt scant one cupful sugar one cupful boiling water one quarter cupful molasses one teaspoonful crisco two cupfuls chopped cranberries sift together the cornstarch salt and sugar pour on the boiling water and stir until boiling add the other ingredients and let simmer fifteen minutes apple peach or pineapple marmalade make good fillings for a pastry shell baked on an inverted plate heat the marmalade and turn it once into a shell canned pineapple filling to a pint can of grated pineapple add half a cupful of sugar and the juice of half a lemon let simmer until thick then use as above apple pie pastry four to six apples one quarter teaspoon salt three quarter to one cupful sugar one to two teaspoonfuls crisco grating of nutmeg two to three tablespoonfuls cold water use either plain or flaky pastry or use plain pastry for the lower and flaky pastry for the upper crusts take half the paste to be used onto the cloth covered board dredge lightly with flour and knead slightly roll into a round to fit the plate trim as needed to have nearly one-fourth an inch of paste beyond the edge entirely around the plate slice the apples into the plate mix the salt and sugar and spread over the apples and put on the crisco in bits here and there add the nutmeg and water brush over the edge of the paste with cold water and set the second round of paste above the apple letting it lie a little loose press the edges of paste together and trim if needed bake about half an hour after the pie has been in the oven five or six minutes the paste should have risen somewhat cut several slits in the upper crust before setting it in place squash pie one quarter cupful crisco three quarter cupful sugar two eggs or one egg and two crackers rolled fine three quarter teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful cinnamon one and one quarter cupful strained squash one cupful milk one quarter cupful cream cream the crisco and beat the eggs add half the sugar to the crisco the other half of the eggs and combine the two add the other ingredients and mix again bake in a plate lined as for a custard pie chicken pie one chicken cut in pieces and cooked salt and pepper to season two and one half cupfuls pastry flour two and one half teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt two-thirds cupful crisco one half cupful cold water some flowers take up more water than others one quarter cupful crisco set the hot chicken in a baking dish sprinkle on salt and pepper pour on the broth to nearly cover the chicken have ready the pastry set it above the chicken letting the edge rest on the dish bake about half an hour for the pastry sift together the flour baking powder and salt with two knives work in the two-thirds cupful of crisco then gradually add the water and work to a paste knead the paste slightly on a floured board roll into a rectangular sheet spread one half with crisco fold the other half of the paste over the crisco and fold as before roll into a sheet fold three times then roll to fit the dish trim the paste as needed cut figures from these trimmings brush the underside with cold water and set on the large piece of pastry easy chicken patties cut flaky pastry rolled into a thin sheet into rounds to fit small tins press them on inverted tins and prick with a fork to let out air beneath set the pastry covered tins on a tin sheet and let bake ten or twelve minutes cut out rounds for covers decorate with small figures cut from the paste and brush underneath with cold water to make them adhere chill and bake remove the paste from the tins fill with two cupfuls of cubes of cooked chicken stirred into two cupfuls of cream sauce and set the covers above serve at once cream sauce one quarter cupful crisco one quarter cupful flour one quarter teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful pepper two cupfuls milk or for patties 
one cupful milk and one cupful chicken broth melt the crisco in it cook the flour and seasoning add the liquid and stir constantly until boiling shoe paste cream cakes one half cupful crisco one cupful boiling water one cupful pastry flour three eggs filling two cupfuls milk one half cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt two eggs three quarter cupful sugar one teaspoonful vanilla put the crisco over the fire in the water when again boiling sift in the flour and stir and cook until the mixture leaves the sides of the pan a smooth paste turn into an earthen bowl and beat in the eggs one at a time beat in each egg thoroughly before the next is added drop onto a baking sheet in irregular rounds about three inches in diameter bake in an oven with strong heat on the bottom about twenty five minutes when done the cakes will feel light taken in the hand when cool open on one side and insert the filling to make the filling stir a little of the milk with the flour and salt to make a thin paste cook this in the rest of the milk scald it over hot water stirring constantly until the mixture thickens let cook fifteen minutes beat the eggs add the sugar and beat again then stir into the hot mixture stir and cook until the egg is cooked let cool then add the vanilla and use cornbread one half cupful crisco one half cupful sugar three egg yolks one and one quarter cupful sweet milk seven eighths cupful cornmeal two cupfuls sifted pastry flour five teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt two egg whites beaten dry cream the crisco beat in the sugar then the yolks beaten light sift together the cornmeal flour baking powder and salt add to the first mixture alternately with the milk then beat in the whites of eggs bake in a well criscoed pan about twenty five minutes coffee cake one cake compressed yeast one quarter cupful lukewarm water one cupful scalded and cooled milk about one and three quarter cupfuls flour three quarter teaspoonful salt one quarter cupful sugar one third cupful melted crisco one egg beaten light flour for soft dough about three cupfuls egg white three tablespoonfuls sugar one tablespoonful cinnamon one quarter cupful sliced almonds mix the yeast with the water add to the milk with flour for the sponge and beat until smooth cover and let become light add the salt sugar melted crisco egg and flour as needed beat until smooth cover and set aside to become doubled in bulk cut down and spread in a pan rubbed over with crisco when again light brush the top of the cake with egg white dredge with the sugar and cinnamon and sprinkle on the nuts bake about twenty five minutes use a pan about ten by eight inches end of section seven section eight of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b breads four of the simplest ingredients in the culinary laboratory flour salt liquid and yeast enter into the composition of a loaf of bread yet the changes through which these materials pass before a finished loaf is evolved are the most complicated in all cookery all the foodstuffs are found in bread which if well made has high nutritive value the liquid used in bread may be milk or water or a portion of each milk increases the nutritive value of the loaf the protein in flour is in the form of gluten and while elasticity is a property of all proteins the gluten in wheat possesses this property in marked degree this strong elastic gluten makes a good framework to retain the air and carbon dioxide and renders wheat the ideal grain for bread making the protein in oats and corn are deficient in this property and when used in bread making are combined with wheat wheat and flour vary greatly in the quantity of gluten present even the same variety of wheat will vary from season to season also in connection with the kind of wheat the time of planting affects the quantity and quality of the gluten spring wheat sown in the spring and harvested the same season contains more protein and consequently more gluten than winter wheat sown in the fall and harvested in the early part of the next summer 
flour from spring wheat rich in gluten is well adapted to bread making and is known as bread flour it is creamy in color granular to the touch and passes through a sieve easily a slight jar sends it through flour from winter wheat is whiter in color and soft to the touch if a quantity be crushed in the hand it will retain the impress of the lines in the hand it tastes sweet for what it lacks in gluten is made up in starch it is adapted to the making of cake and pastry articles foods in which delicacy rather than strength is sought such flour is known as pastry flour wise of bread making one why use bread flour in all yeast mixtures answer it costs less to use bread flour for yeast mixtures than it does to use pastry flour less flour is required in making bread flour is added to liquid to make a dough stiff enough to knead the liquid will take up a smaller measure of bread flour than of pastry flour bread flour contains a higher percentage of protein gluten than does pastry flour it is an advantage to get considerable protein from bread gluten also has the property of elasticity and by its stretching makes a tough framework to hold up the cellular structure of the loaf two why use milk in mixing bread answer the bread is more nutritious when milk is used milk being a protein or tissue builder the spongy texture is preferred by some three why use water in mixing bread answer water is cheaper the bread keeps moist longer than when milk is used the texture of the bread is preferred by some four why not soften yeast in boiling hot water answer boiling water poured over a sprouting seed or young plant would destroy its life the vitality of a yeast cake which is a collection of plants massed together would be destroyed just as certainly if it be mixed with boiling water yeast plants bear cold better than heat and may be kept alive some days in a refrigerator five why soften a yeast cake in a small measure of liquid answer a yeast cake may be mixed thoroughly through a small measure of liquid if added directly to the full measure of liquid to be used it often fails of being distributed evenly through the dough six why add flour to liquid rather than liquid to flour answer the measure of liquid decides the number and size of the loaves the measure of flour largely decides the texture of the loaf one cupful of liquid makes a loaf of bread for a brick loaf pan of ordinary size seven why mix bread dough in an earthen bowl answer an earthen bowl holds warmth longer than a metal receptacle also from metal receptacles the knife used in mixing would be liable to scrape metal into the dough eight why mix bread dough with a knife answer a dough is too heavy for beating it is mixed by being turned over and over and by cutting down through it for such motions a knife not too flexible is the implement most easily used nine is it better to mix bread at night answer bread mixed at night is ready to shape into loaves the first thing in the morning and may be baked immediately after breakfast by-products of fermentation which give a characteristic sweetness to bread are generated during the long process the cost of yeast is less because one yeast cake will make six loaves of bread or its equivalent in bread and biscuit ten why mix in the morning answer the dough may be watched and kept in good condition eleven why knead bread dough answer bread dough is kneaded the first time to distribute the ingredients evenly through the mass to give body to the dough to bring out the elasticity of the gluten in the flour and to make the mixture smooth the second kneading is to break up the large cavities caused by gas bubbles and to make the texture uniform and fine twelve why use shortening crisco in bread answer shortening makes tender bread thirteen why shape the dough for brick loaf pan in two rounds answer a loaf of bread baked in two rounds gives slices of a nearly uniform size if doubt is felt as to the degree of baking the loaf may be split apart at the center and the condition noted if properly baked the crumb will rebound under pressure fourteen why bake bread in small loaves answer 
bread is baked in small loaves that it may be baked through to the very center of the loaf in a small loaf the proportion of crust to crumb is greater than in a large loaf fifteen why is a large proportion of crust desirable answer on account of the higher degree dry heat to which the crust is subjected the starch in composition is changed to dextrin which is more easily digested than starch some probably most of the starch in the crust has been changed by the dry heat moisture keeps the heat down at the center of the loaf to dextrin dextrin is soluble in water starch is not and is thus partially digested many people do not digest starch readily the crust would correspond to toast in toast the moisture is first dried out slowly then the bread is put over strong heat which changes the starch on the surface to dextrin that is more easily digested sixteen why bake bread thoroughly answer bread is baked to kill the yeast plants which have served their purpose to drive off the alcohol and carbon dioxide gas and to harden the cell walls it should also be well baked to ensure its keeping in good condition seventeen why is yeast used in bread making answer yeast is used in bread making to make the bread light and porous and thus easily masticated and to allow the digestive fluids to penetrate it readily eighteen why does yeast make bread light answer commercial yeast is a collection of yeast plants in a state of rest provide them with moisture warmth and the food they like present in flour the plant will grow and multiply as the plant feed they cause the sugar in composition to be broken up and bubbles of gas and alcohol are formed the sticky gluten of the flour holds the bubbles and causes the mass to swell or rise nineteen what is the difference between a quick medium or slow oven and the effects of same answer heat indicators set into oven doors of some cooking ranges are a guide to the heat of the oven and of great help in baking they do not register heat in degrees with the hand on the dial at twelve o'clock the heat is right for cake in small tins layers or thin loaves pies bread etc with the hand at any point before twelve o'clock the heat is moderate to slow according to the distance from twelve o'clock with the hand at a point beyond twelve o'clock the oven is hot or very hot according to the distance beyond that point with the thermometer bread pies and plain cake should be set to bake at 380 degrees fahrenheit or when a bit of white paper dropped into the oven will become a delicate brown in five minutes for biscuits muffins or small cakes the paper should become a deep golden brown in five minutes with the oven in this latter condition the thermometer would register 440 degrees fahrenheit 20 why not hurry bread and rolls in the second rising answer the shapes given to bread and rolls are retained more perfectly if the rising be natural and uniform twenty one why wash and crisco the bowl in which dough for rolls as parker house is set to rise answer if the bowl be thus treated and the dough when well risen is not kept down or disturbed in any way it may be turned upside down on a lightly floured board and rolled into a thin sheet with very few movements of the rolling pin also when cut into rounds and folded the rolls will hold their shape without flying back twenty two why are southern beaten biscuit considered a wholesome article of food answer beaten biscuit are mixed very stiff but very little shortening or liquid being used they are lightened by air that is beaten into them and when baked are dry to be swallowed readily they must be masticated for some time and this ensures digestion twenty three why are corn meal rye meal or graham muffins baked in a hot iron muffin pan considered more wholesome than the same mixture baked in a sheet and cut into squares answer the whole surface of each muffin is crusty and much of it has been changed by heat to dextrin and this is the first step in digestion also being crusty the muffin is liable to be more thoroughly masticated than the softer product baked in a sheet this is further gain. 24. Why do we use baking powder in muffins, biscuits, griddle cakes, waffles, cake, etc.? Answer. Baking powder is used in flour mixtures to make them light. 
digestion is the first step in the change of food to produce body substance or energy and food that is light is easily penetrated by the digestive fluids twenty five why does baking powder make certain foods light answer baking powder is a mixture of an acid and an alkaline carbonate mixed with a starch to separate the two ingredients where these two are dissolved together a chemical action takes place and a gas is given off if this action takes place in a moist flour mixture the mass is lightened thereby twenty six why are sour milk and carbonate of soda and acid molasses and soda not as satisfactory means of generating gas for lightening dough as baking powder answer both sour milk and molasses vary so much in acidity from time to time that it is not easy to determine the quantity of soda to use if too little is taken gas enough to make the mixture light will not be evolved and if too much is taken there will not be enough acid to neutralize it and the food will be yellow and unwholesome recipes two loaves white bread one-third cake compressed yeast at night one half cupful water two cupfuls scalded milk or half milk and half water two tablespoonfuls crisco two tablespoonfuls sugar one teaspoonful salt about seven cupfuls flour to the milk or milk and water add the crisco sugar and salt when lukewarm add the yeast mixed with the half cupful of liquid and the flour use an earthen bowl and mix with a knife to a dough knead until elastic let rise in a temperature of about seventy five degrees fahrenheit the shelf over the stove is not a suitable place when doubled in bulk shape into two loaves when again light bake about one hour to mix in the morning use one whole yeast cake noisette bread one cake compressed yeast one fourth cupful lukewarm water one cupful scalded milk one tablespoonful crisco one half teaspoonful salt two tablespoonfuls molasses one cupful or less noisette or filbert meats left whole one half cupful white flour three cupfuls or more whole wheat flour mix the yeast with the water to the milk add the crisco molasses salt and nut meats and when lukewarm add the yeast and flour and mix to a dough knead until smooth and elastic let rise until doubled in bulk shape into a loaf when again light bake one hour without the nuts this is good plain whole wheat bread to mix at night use one-third cake compressed yeast quick yeast rolls one cupful scalded milk one quarter cupful crisco one level tablespoonful sugar one half teaspoonful salt one cake compressed yeast one quarter cupful lukewarm water bread flour for soft dough about four cupfuls add the crisco sugar and salt to the scalded milk when lukewarm add the yeast mixed with the water and stir in the flour do not mix the dough stiff enough to knead mix cut and turn over and over with a knife cover and set aside to become light with criscoed fingers pull off bits of the dough of the same size and work it into smooth balls set these some distance apart in criscoed pans that they may be crusty and when again light bake about half an hour rye meal bread one cake compressed yeast one half cupful lukewarm water one and one quarter cupful scalded milk one third cupful molasses two tablespoonfuls crisco one teaspoonful salt one and one half cupfuls bread flour one and one half cupfuls graham flour one cupful rye meal soften yeast in water to milk add molasses crisco and salt when lukewarm add yeast mixed through water stir in the flour and meal sift flour and meal first have dough quite stiff but not enough to knead cover and let stand until double in bulk cut down and turn into bread pan size of brick loaf when again light bake one hour quick sally lun one cake compressed yeast one fourth cupful scalded and cooled milk one cupful scalded milk two tablespoonfuls crisco one half teaspoonful salt two tablespoonfuls sugar one egg beaten light two and one quarter cupfuls bread flour mix the yeast with the one fourth cupful of milk add the crisco salt and sugar to the hot milk 
and when cool to lukewarm add the milk and yeast the egg and the flour beat until smooth and turn into a criscoed pan about ten by five and a half inches let stand covered and out of draughts until nearly doubled in bulk brush over the top with melted crisco dredge with granulated sugar and bake about twenty five minutes serve hot or when cold cut in slices and toast squash buns one-third cake compressed yeast one-half cupful lukewarm water one-half cupful scalded milk one-half cupful cooked squash one-quarter cupful brown sugar one-half teaspoonful salt one quarter cupful melted crisco about three cupfuls bread flour one tablespoonful cornstarch three tablespoonfuls cold water one half cupful or more boiling water granulated sugar soften yeast in water add milk squash sugar salt crisco and flour mix to a soft dough knead nearly ten minutes using no more flour than necessary set in a clean criscoed bowl cover and let stand overnight when the mixture should have doubled in bulk turn upside down on a floured board roll into a sheet nearly an inch thick dip a cutter in flour and cut into rounds set close together in a baking pan brushing the surfaces that come in contact with melted crisco when very light doubled in bulk bake about half an hour mix the cornstarch with cold water add the boiling water stir until boiling let simmer until the buns are baked brush with the starch dredge with sugar set into the oven until the sugar melts and glazes the buns individual chicken pies one quarter cupful crisco one quarter cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful paprika one cupful thin cream one cupful chicken broth two and a half cupfuls cooked chicken in cubes melt the crisco in it cook the flour and seasonings add the cream and broth and stir until bubbly add the chicken and let become very hot turn into individual dishes glass or crockery set above the chicken in each dish three or four hot baking powder biscuit about an inch and a quarter in diameter serve at once cooked celery in quarter inch slices may replace part of the chicken baking powder biscuit two cupfuls pastry flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt three tablespoonfuls crisco about three-quarter cupful milk or water sift the dry ingredients together twice and cut in the crisco with two knives add the milk gradually and mix to a dough that cleans the bowl turn the dough on a floured board roll with a knife to coat with flour knead slightly then pat and roll into a sheet half an inch thick cut in rounds set in crisco tin and brush over the biscuits with melted crisco bake about fifteen minutes potato biscuit one and one half cupfuls pastry flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one cupful mashed potato one fourth cupful crisco milk as needed sift together the flour baking powder and salt add the potato pressed through a ricer cut in the crisco then use milk as needed to mix a dough that cleans the bowl turn on a floured board with the knife to coat with flour knead slightly then pat and roll into a sheet cut in rounds and bake about fifteen minutes in a quick oven nut and fruit rolls three cupfuls pastry flour five teaspoonfuls baking powder three-quarter teaspoonful salt one-third cupful crisco one egg beaten light three-quarters cupful milk nearly one tablespoonful softened crisco one-third cupful dried currants one-third cupful nut meats broken in pieces two tablespoonfuls sugar one teaspoonful cinnamon if desired sift together the dry ingredients twice and with two knives cut in the crisco add part of the milk to the egg and use in mixing the dry ingredients to a dough that cleans the bowl use more of the milk as is required turn the dough on a floured board roll to coat lightly with flour knead and roll into a rectangular sheet one-third an inch thick spread with the softened crisco sprinkle over the other ingredients and roll compactly as a jelly roll cut in pieces an inch and a half long set on end close together in a criscoed pan bake about twenty-five minutes 
chicken roly-poly two cupfuls pastry flour three teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt one quarter cupful crisco one egg beaten light two-thirds cupful milk about one and one half cupfuls chopped chicken one half cupful chicken gravy or cream sauce one quarter cupful crisco one quarter cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful black pepper two cupfuls chicken broth make a biscuit dough of the ingredients in the first column and roll into a rectangular sheet one-fourth an inch thick mix the chicken with the half cupful of sauce and spread over the dough roll compactly like a jelly roll and set into a baking pan brush over with a little of the egg reserved for the purpose bake about twenty minutes serve cut in pieces with a sauce made of the crisco flour seasonings and broth ham lamb or veal may be used in the same way philadelphia butter buns one cake compressed yeast one quarter cupful water one cupful scalded milk one and one half cupfuls bread flour one quarter cupful granulated sugar one quarter cupful crisco melted two egg yolks one teaspoonful salt grated rind one lemon flour for dough three to four tablespoonful softened crisco three quarter cupful brown sugar one tablespoonful cinnamon one half cupful currants or raisins make a sponge of the first four ingredients when light add the sugar crisco egg yolk salt rind and flour about three cupfuls of flour will be required knead until smooth and elastic cover close and set aside to become doubled in bulk turn upside down on a board roll into a rectangular sheet spread with softened crisco dredge with one or two tablespoonfuls of the sugar and the cinnamon then sprinkle with the fruit and roll as a jelly roll cut into pieces about an inch and a quarter long the dough will make sixteen buns put three tablespoonfuls of crisco into a pan seven by ten inches sprinkle in the rest of the brown sugar set the buns on the sugar and let become light bake in a moderate oven turn upside down the sugar and crisco should glaze the bottom of the buns serve with coffee or cocoa these are good reheated quick nut bread two cupfuls pastry flour one cupful graham flour one teaspoonful salt one cupful sugar five teaspoonfuls baking powder one cupful chopped nut meats two tablespoonfuls melted crisco one egg beaten light one cupful water sift together the first five ingredients add the nuts the crisco and the egg mixed with the water and stir all together turn into a criscoed bread pan and let stand fifteen minutes bake three quarters of an hour apple dumpling fill a pudding dish with pared quartered and cored apples cut in slices prepare the dough as given on page sixty two for strawberry shortcake sprinkle half a teaspoonful of salt and one-fourth a cupful of hot water over the apples then over them spread the dough let bake in a moderate oven about half an hour turn upside down on a serving dish and serve at once with butter and sugar or maple syrup sliced peaches make a good dumpling cornmeal griddle cakes one cupful sweet milk one half cupful cornmeal two-thirds cupful white flour two and one half teaspoonfuls baking powder one quarter teaspoonful salt one tablespoonful sugar one egg beaten light two tablespoonfuls melted crisco at night scald the milk and pour over the cornmeal mix cover and let stand overnight sift together the rest of the dry ingredients and add to the meal with the egg and crisco mix and bake on a hot criscoed griddle when the cakes are full of bubbles turn to brown the other side more milk may be needed in the morning rich graham muffins one half cupful crisco three quarter cupful sugar two eggs beaten light one quarter teaspoonful soda one half cupful thick sour milk one cupful white flour one cupful graham flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt cream the crisco beat in the sugar and the eggs sift the soda into the sour milk mix thoroughly and add to the first mixture sift together the white flour the graham flour baking powder and salt and stir into the liquid bake in a hot well criscoed muffin pan 
about 25 minutes. White Muffins 2 cupfuls sifted pastry flour 4 teaspoonfuls baking powder 3 quarter teaspoonful salt 1 fourth cupful sugar if desired 1 egg beaten light 1 cupful milk about 4 tablespoonfuls crisco melted sift together the first four ingredients twice add the milk to the beaten egg and stir into the dry ingredients beat in the crisco bake in a hot well criscoed cast iron pan about 25 minutes for a change figs or dates cut in small pieces may be mixed through the dry ingredients before the liquid is added meat pie biscuit crust use remnants of roast beef lamb or veal or broiled steak remove all unedible portions from the meat cover with a broth made from the bones and trimmings covered with cold water and a few slices of onion carrot celery and parsley leaves and let simmer until tender skim the meat about a quart into a baking dish stir one-third a cupful of flour three-fourths a teaspoonful of salt half a teaspoonful of pepper and half a cupful of cold water to a smooth paste then add to the hot broth three cupfuls and stir until boiling pour part of this sauce over the meat reserve the rest to serve in a bowl for the crust sift together three cupfuls of flour five teaspoonfuls of baking powder and three-fourths a teaspoonful of salt cut in one-third a cupful of crisco and mix to a dough with milk knead slightly roll into a sheet to fit the baking dish which should be broad and shallow rather than deep cut several slits in the top and set it above the meat resting on the edge of the dish rubbed over with crisco brush over the top of the crust with melted crisco or beaten egg that it may bake to a rich brown bake about half an hour for a higher flavored dish add to the sauce two tablespoonfuls of worcestershire sauce tomato or mushroom ketchup or chili sauce one fourth a cupful of dried mushrooms soaked in cold water may also be added to the meat soft cornbread one quart milk one cupful white cornmeal one teaspoonful salt two teaspoonfuls crisco one egg beaten light two tablespoonfuls baking powder scald the milk in a double boiler when the milk is scalded and the water in the lower dish is boiling gradually stir the cornmeal into the milk continue to stir until the mixture thickens slightly then cover and let cook stirring occasionally for two hours beat in the salt crisco egg and baking powder and turn into a well criscoed baking dish suitable for the table bake about one hour serve hot from the dish this is often called spoon cornbread as it is soft and served with a spoon good for either luncheon or dinner honey cookies one half cupful crisco three quarter cupful granulated sugar one half cupful honey grated rind one lemon one egg and one yolk three cupfuls or more of flour four teaspoonfuls baking powder one teaspoonful salt chopped almonds about twelve one egg white and granulated sugar for glazing beat the crisco to a cream and gradually beat in the sugar and the honey add the lemon rind the egg and yolk beaten together and the flour sifted with the baking powder and salt and mix to a dough that may be kneaded more flour may be required knead a portion of the dough on a floured board roll into a thin sheet and cut into rounds rub over the baking pan with crisco set the cookies in place brush them with the egg white reserved for the purpose and slightly beaten then sprinkle with the chopped nuts dredge with sugar and bake to an amber color tea scones two cupfuls pastry flour two tablespoonfuls sugar one teaspoonful salt four teaspoonfuls baking powder three tablespoonfuls crisco one egg beaten light one half to two-thirds cupful milk sugar for dredging sift together the dry ingredients twice and work in the crisco with two knives add the half cupful of milk to the egg and gradually use in mixing a dough use more milk if needed turn on a floured board knead slightly pat and roll into a sheet cut into rounds set in crisco tin brush over with melted crisco and dredge with sugar bake about fifteen minutes serve with tea or cocoa whole wheat muffins one cupful white flour one cupful entire wheat flour two tablespoonfuls sugar one half teaspoonful salt 
four teaspoonfuls baking powder one egg one and one quarter cupfuls milk three tablespoonfuls melted crisco sift together all the dry ingredients add the well-beaten egg milk and melted crisco beat thoroughly and bake about twenty five minutes in a hot criscoed iron muffin pan rice griddle cakes one half cupful rice washed one teaspoonful salt three cupfuls boiling water one and one half cupfuls cooked rice two egg yolks beaten light one cupful flour two teaspoonfuls baking powder one half teaspoonful salt two tablespoonfuls melted crisco two egg whites beaten light add the salt to the boiling water and in it cook the rice till tender then press through a potato ricer or sieve to one cupful and a half of rice pulp add the yolks and the dry ingredients and mix thoroughly add the crisco and whites beat together and bake at once on a hot well criscoed griddle end of section eight section nine of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b meats one why does cooking make meat more palatable answer cooking meat sterilizes or destroys parasites or bacteria that may be present coagulates albuminous juices thereby improving their appearance makes tough tissues tender and brings out and accentuates agreeable flavor two why do the tough cuts of meat and mutton come from the neck and legs and the tender cuts from the middle of the back answer exercise toughens muscles and connective tissues thus muscles in those parts of the creature that are used constantly will be less tender than muscles protected somewhat from use three why is the nutritive value of tough meat as high or even higher than that of tender meat answer the same exercise that toughens muscles draws the nutritive foodstuffs juices to them four why in boiling parboiling roasting and broiling meats do we first of all subject the entire surface to very strong heat answer high heat will coagulate the albumin and harden the fibers on the surface of the meat and thus keep the nutriment within the meat five why in making soup or broth cut the meat into small pieces cover these with cold water and heat the water very slowly answer we present just as much surface as possible to the action of the cold water and let the water heat gradually that the juices in the meat may be drawn out into the water six why in making stews and pot roast do we cover the meat with cold water and bring it quickly to the boiling point or sear the meat on the outside with high heat and then add a little cold liquid and finish cooking at a gentle simmer answer in stews and pot roasts we wish part of the juice to remain in the meat and part to be drawn out into the liquid and proceed accordingly seven why should even a well-done steak or roast present a puffy appearance answer puffiness is a characteristic of meat that is not overcooked if meat be subjected to a high temperature for too long a time the albuminous juices are hardened and turn brown throughout the cut after the surface of the meat is seared over the heat must be allowed to coagulate the juices only slightly and keep them jelly-like and the color a light pink lack of puffiness means bad cooking and hardening and shriveling of nutritive matter eight why in setting a steak to cook in a double broiler have the edge of fat next to the handle of the broiler answer with the fat toward the handle the meat is basted during cooking with the melting fat nine why turn a steak each ten seconds for the first half of the cooking and then draw it farther from the heat and turn less often answer the steak is turned to sear and cook both sides evenly and to avoid burning also if not turned quickly the heat would drive juices from the exposed surface into the fire it is not as essential to turn so often during the last of the cooking after the outside is seared over with strong heat to keep in the juices 
the cooking is completed at a lower temperature that the meat may be thoroughly cooked and the juices within be jelly-like ten why have the pan at blue heat when pan broiling steak or chops answer high heat is needed for the initial searing over also meat will not stick to an extremely hot surface the pan must be kept hot and the meat turned constantly eleven why have no fat in the pan when pan broiling answer if there be fat in the pan the meat is not pan broiled but sautéed twelve why does it take a longer time to pan broil a steak than to cook the same steak over a bed of coals answer direct heat is more powerful than indirect heat thirteen why does it take longer to broil hamburg steak than an ordinary steak of same thickness answer in an ordinary steak the heat follows the little muscle tubes but in hamburg steak it is deflected this way and that by connective tissue chopped and disposed irregularly fourteen why set roasts of beef mutton and poultry into a hot oven and roasts of lamb veal and pork into a moderately heated oven answer to be wholesome pork and immature meat as veal and lamb need to be thoroughly cooked to the very centre of the roast if a heavy coating be formed on the outside the heat cannot penetrate the joint thus the loss of juice is preferable in the case of these meats to lack of thorough cooking at the center fifteen why set fresh meat to boil in boiling water and ham and corned beef salted meats to cook in cold water answer the juices are to be held within the fresh meat and some of the salt drawn out of the salt meats the salt meats lose nutriment both in pickling and cooking but are valuable for variety and for emergencies sixteen why brown poultry chops steaks etc before setting them to cook in a casserole answer the meats are brown to intensify flavor a sort of meat caramel flavor cooked even in liquid in a casserole with a close fitting cover the flavor is retained seventeen why baste roasts while cooking with hot fat rather than with fat and hot water answer roasts are basted to keep them from becoming too dry and also to send the heat into the meat if hot water be added to the fat moisture is produced and the flavor of the roast is changed reserve water for the joints with much connective tissue which require long cooking and much moisture after the joint is seared over the temperature of the oven should be lowered if the fat burns in the least the oven is too hot for successful cooking the fat dripping from the roast beef is as a rule all that is needed for basting but poultry veal and lamb require additional fat eighteen why dredge a roast with flour after basting with fat answer the flour combining with the hot fat gives a frothy crusty appearance that is attractive to the eye also some of the flour browns in the pan making a good foundation for a brown sauce to serve with the roast nineteen why adapt the size of the pan to the roast and use a rack under the joint answer if the pan be large a correspondingly large quantity of fat must be used in basting or the pan will burn if the meat be not lifted out of the fat the portion in the fat will be fried in it and become overcooked twenty why are moisture and prolonged cooking at a gentle heat essential in cooking tough meat answer the albuminous proteins are to be coagulated stiffened delicately as in tender meat but the connective tissue of which there is considerable the quantity varying with the cut of meat age etc is to be changed to gelatin dry heat and a high temperature will harden this tissue but low heat long continued in the presence of moisture will transform it to gelatin and the little bundles of fibers will fall apart easily twenty one why should the framework of roast meat and fowls be used in making stock answer the brown juices of meat found on the bones gristle fat etc are of most agreeable flavor and if dissolved in water may be used to add flavor to foods deficient in this property as rice macaroni and many vegetables twenty two why is it important that meats fish fowl and soup stock 
not to be eaten at once should be cooled rapidly answer this is done as a precaution against ptomaine poisoning poisons are liable to develop in protein substances that stand too long at a temperature neither hot nor cold this is especially to be guarded against in hot weather and with meat slightly underdone recipes beef steak chowder one pound round steak three tablespoonfuls crisco one onion one quart boiling water one teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful pepper one and one half cupfuls thin cream or rich milk scalded over hot water four potatoes cut the steak into strips an inch and a half long and half an inch thick and wide melt the crisco add the onion cut in very thin slices and stir and cook until the onion is softened and yellowed add the boiling water let simmer five minutes add the pieces of steak let boil five minutes then simmer until the meat is tender pare the potatoes cut in thin slices and let cook in boiling water five minutes drain rinse in cold water and drain again then add to the meat with the salt and pepper add more water if needed to cover the potatoes when the potatoes are tender add the milk or cream and additional seasoning if necessary serve with crackers leftover steak may be used jugged chicken separate a chicken into pieces at the joints take two or three tablespoonfuls of flour and half a teaspoonful each of salt and pepper mix all together thoroughly in this roll the pieces of chicken after dipping them in milk or water then pack them solidly in an earthen baking pot cover the whole with sweet milk then adjust the cover and let bake until the chicken is tender smothered or pan chicken cut a clean chicken down the back and wipe inside and out with the cloth wrung repeatedly out of cold water rub the flesh over with salt and pepper and set in the inner pan of a double roasting pan pour a cupful of hot milk or white stock into the pan cover and set into a hot oven cream three tablespoonfuls of crisco beat into this three tablespoonfuls of flour and spread over the hot chicken let cook ten or fifteen minutes then baste with the liquid in the pan baste each fifteen minutes thereafter until the chicken is cooked the time of cooking will vary according to the age of the chicken from one to two hours will be needed when the chicken is tender remove it to a serving dish add milk or water in quantity as needed and stir until the liquid boils pour this over the chicken and serve at once boiled ham let the ham soak several hours or overnight after scraping and scrubbing thoroughly with a brush to cook cover with cold water bring solely to the boiling point let boil a few moments then skim and let simmer five hours or more when tender set aside to partially cool in the liquid then remove draw off the skin brush over with beaten yolk of egg diluted with milk sprinkle with sugar and cracker crumbs mixed together and set in the oven to brown cover the bone with a paper frill garnish the disc with parsley also serve cold sliced thin sausages baked with creamed potatoes chop fine four cold boiled potatoes season slightly with salt and dispose in an au gratin dish pour in milk or cream to come nearly to the top of the potatoes prick the casings of one pound of sausage and lower them in a frying basket into a kettle of hot crisco count sixty then remove and dispose over the potatoes for a small frying kettle cook the sausage in two lots half a pound at a time pour over the sausage a cupful of rather thick white sauce one made with chicken or veal broth preferred use two and one half tablespoons of flour and two tablespoonfuls of crisco to the cupful of liquid cover the sauce with three-fourths a cupful of cracker crumbs mixed with three tablespoonfuls of melted crisco let bake about fifteen minutes serve for luncheon or supper spiced beef have a piece cut from the round three inches thick with a sharp knife make several incisions like the sign of addition clear through the meal into each of these press a slice of breakfast bacon rub over the outside of the meat with salt pepper and flour set in an earthen dish and pour on half a cupful of vinegar a tablespoonful of sugar one-fourth a teaspoonful of mustard and a cupful of water heated to the boiling point 
cover and let cook in the oven slowly five or six hours basting occasionally and adding water if needed casserole of round steak cut round steak in pieces about two inches square and let brown in three or four tablespoonfuls crisco melted in a frying pan remove to a casserole and add broth to cover add more crisco to the pan and in it brown a small blanched onion for each service add these to the casserole cover and let cook about two hours or until nearly tender add for each service two small strips of carrot and half a dozen cubes or balls of potato parboiled and browned in the frying pan also salt and pepper is needed and let cook until the vegetables are tender if the beef be rolled in flour it will brown more quickly corn beef hash chop fine an equal quantity of cold corn beef and boiled potatoes stir in a little broth or boiling water and turn into three or four tablespoonfuls of crisco melted in a frying pan stir and cook until hot throughout then let stand to color and crust slightly on the bottom fold as an omelet turn on to a hot serving dish serve at the same time radishes sliced tomatoes pickled beets chili sauce or tomato ketchup roast sirloin of beef wipe the meat with a damp cloth dredge the fat with salt and flour and the flesh with flour rubbing it well into the flesh set to cook in a hot oven the sirloin shown in the illustration is set skin side up the way in which the roast will be sent to the table to cook turn the under or tenderloin side uppermost that the meat unprotected by fat may be seared over on the outside and the juice is kept within after the roast is half cooked turn the fat side up and finish the cooking on this side letting the fat become well browned baste each ten minutes with the fat in the pan and dredge with flour after each basting the heat should be such that the fat and flour in the pan be not overcooked if too dark the fat is not fit for basting and the flour and meat juices are unsuitable for brown sauce to be served with the roast cook a roast about twelve minutes for each pound when done the meat should be pink at the center brown sauce for roast beef when the meat is cooked remove from the pan to the warming oven it may be cut more easily after standing half an hour pour the fat from the pan add two cupfuls of boiling water to the brown flour in the pan and stir and let boil that the water may take up the browned meat juice adhering to the pan put one-fourth a cupful of the fat in a saucepan add three tablespoonfuls of flour and cook until frothy let cool add the liquid from the baking pan and stir until boiling then strain and use brown fricassee of veal melt four tablespoonfuls of crisco in an iron frying pan cut veal steak in pieces for serving roll in flour and set to cook in the hot crisco when the veal is browned on one side turn to brown the other side then add light broth or water to cover and let cook at a gentle simmer about one hour stir one-fourth a cupful of flour for each pint of liquid half a teaspoonful of salt and one-fourth a teaspoonful of pepper with cold water to form a smooth thin paste add to the meat stir until boiling and let simmer ten to fifteen minutes when the dish is ready to serve a little tomato puree is a good addition to the sauce beef stew four tablespoonfuls crisco two and a half pounds chuck roast three peeled onions in slices one carrot six potatoes sliced salt and pepper melt the crisco in the frying pan cut the meat into small pieces and brown part of the pieces in the hot crisco cover the rest of the meat with cold water and heat quickly to the boiling point add the meat from the frying pan and turn some of the hot liquid into the pan let it stand over the fire until the glaze is dissolved from the pan then add to the meat cover and let simmer about three hours add the onions and carrot scraped and cut in slices and let cook half an hour then add the potatoes pared rinsed parboiled and drained and let cook until the potatoes are tender when all should be cooked add salt and pepper as needed and the stew is ready two and a half pounds from the hind shank of beef which is largely lean meat and bone may also be used and costs less than the chuck broiled tripe with bacon rolls 
simmer fresh tripe in boiling water until very tender it will take five or six hours of cooking add salt during the last of the cooking drain and set aside in a covered dish until ready to use brush over the portion to be used honeycomb tripe is considered the best with partly melted crisco and set to cook over the coals or under the gas burner let cook three or four minutes then remove to a hot platter season with a little salt and spread over the top as many slices of broiled bacon as there are individuals to serve bacon rolls may replace the broiled bacon to prepare these run a toothpick through each slice of bacon rolled up like a jelly roll immerse all at once in a basket in hot deep crisco let cook until crisp and a light amber color throughout then drain and use as specified a quarter of a lemon should accompany each portion beef balls with spaghetti one can tomatoes one green pepper in shreds one onion in slices two branches parsley two cupfuls water one teaspoonful salt one pound steak top of round one egg beaten light one quarter cupful soft sifted bread crumbs one teaspoonful grated onion one half teaspoonful salt three tablespoonfuls crisco one half pound spaghetti one half cupful grated parmesan cheese cook the tomatoes green pepper onion parsley water and salt half an hour then press through a sieve into a casserole free the steak of all stringy portions and chop fine add the egg crumbs onion and salt and mix all together thoroughly roll into a dozen balls of the same size heat the crisco in a frying pan and in this cook the balls until well browned on all sides drain on soft paper then transfer to the puree in the casserole cover and let cook about forty five minutes in the meantime cook half a pound of spaghetti in whole or half lengths in boiling salted water until done drain and rinse in cold water when about ready to serve take the meatballs from the casserole turn in the spaghetti and parmesan cheese grated lift with two forks until the whole is well blended then return the meatballs to the casserole cover and return to the oven to become very hot serve from the casserole swiss steak have a steak cut from the top of the round one and a half inches thick pound it with the edge of a heavy earthen plate or a meat tenderer until the fiber is thoroughly broken up dredging over it meanwhile from time to time a little flour by the time the steak is well pounded a generous half cup of flour will have been pounded into it in a large iron frying pan heat two or three tablespoonfuls of crisco in this cook the meat until well browned first on one side and then on the other pour in boiling water barely to cover the meat and let simmer about three hours for variety cook two peeled onions sliced thin in the crisco before the meat remove them and after the meat is browned spread them over the meat to cook with it after the meat is cooked they may be retained in the sauce or strained from it as desired corn beef souffle two and one half cupfuls milk one half cupful celery leaves or stalks one half onion two tablespoonfuls crisco two tablespoonfuls flour one half cupful soft sifted bread crumbs one half teaspoonful paprika one quarter teaspoonful salt two cupfuls cold corned beef chopped fine three eggs beaten separately scald the milk with the celery and onion about fifteen minutes strain and cool a little cook the flour in the crisco add the milk and stir until smooth and boiling add the crumbs paprika salt and beef beat in the yolks then cut and fold in the whites turn into a crisco dish set into a pan of boiling water and let bake about twenty five minutes hamburg steak a la tartare one pound rump or round steak one quarter cup full cold crisco one half a green pepper one slice onion one tablespoonful crisco melted one half teaspoonful salt four egg yolks one and one half cupfuls tomato sauce if round steak be used let it be from the top of the round scrape the pulp of the meat from the nerves and fibers and with a wooden spoon work the crisco into the pulp chop the onion and pepper very fine and cook these in the melted crisco until yellowed and softened add these to the beef with the salt mix thoroughly and roll into four balls press the balls into flat cakes with a depression in the center melt a teaspoonful of crisco in an iron frying pan 
set the meat in the pan and drop the uncooked yolk of an egg into each depression baste the yolks with a little hot crisco and set the frying pan into the oven let cook about five minutes remove to a hot serving dish pour over the hot sauce and serve at once tomato sauce three tablespoonfuls crisco three tablespoonfuls flour one half teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful paprika one cupful tomato puree one half cupful rich brown stock melt the crisco in it cook the flour and seasonings add the puree and stock and stir until boiling beef steak birds have round steak cut very thin pound it with a pestle to reduce the thickness at least one half cut it into pieces about three inches square mix one cupful of soft sifted bread crumbs with one fourth a cupful of crisco a little salt pepper and sweet herbs and use to spread over the pieces of steak roll each piece separately and tie with a bit of string at each end to hold the shape roll in flour and cook in a little hot crisco until browned on all sides add boiling broth or water to the frying pan cover and let cook until the meat is tender about one hour serve with creamed or mashed potatoes Réchauffé of roast veal two tablespoonfuls crisco two tablespoonfuls chopped onion one cupful veal gravy one tablespoonful tomato ketchup eight slices tender cooked veal heat the crisco in it cook the onion until yellowed and softened add the gravy made for the hot roast and the ketchup and heat to the boiling point lay in the slices of veal and let stand over boiling water until very hot if the gravy has not been thickened cook a tablespoonful of flour in the crisco and onion before adding the gravy to them roast leg of pork select a leg from a young pig scrub the skin with care then with a sharp knife score the skin for cutting in thin slices rub over the outside with salt and flour and set to cook in a double or covered roasting pan in an oven of moderate heat after a time add half a cupful or less of broth to the pan if it is needed and let cook about five hours as pork needs to be cooked very thoroughly the outside should not be seared over at first by means of strong heat lest the crust thus formed keep the heat from penetrating to the center of the joint in a double baking pan no basting will be needed in an open pan baste every ten minutes with the dripping in the pan pared and cored apples may be baked in the pan with the meat these will probably require about half an hour to bake crown of pork with small onions cut pieces containing six ribs from each side of a rack of pork having the two pieces of the same length and height remove the backbone and make an incision between the ribs trim each rib above the eye as for french lamb chops turn the rib bones outside and the eyes of the chops inside and sew the two pieces together mix a cupful of sausage meat with a cupful of stale bread crumbs softened in cold water and wrung dry add additional seasonings if needed put the crown in the baking pan add the sausage mixture in the open space inside the crown cover the bones with criscoed paper dredge with salt pepper and flour and bake in a slow oven between two and three hours basting every ten minutes with the dripping to which a little hot water is added melt four tablespoonfuls of crisco in it cook to a delicate brown enough small peeled onions to fill the crown add stock and let cook until tender glazing the onions with the stock as it cooks away remove the crown carefully to a serving dish so as to avoid breaking the sausage filling place the onions in the center above the filling cover the ends of the rib bones with paper frills and garnish with a few sprigs of parsley serve with applesauce and tomatoes in some form end of section nine section ten of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b vegetables food for energy is secured from the carbohydrates at less expense than from the proteins meat fish etc and with less tax on the digestive system 
vegetables including cereals belong to the carbohydrate group one starch vegetable and one green vegetable should always be given a place in the dinner at which meat or fish is served the flavor of meat is agreeable but by using it in small quantity as a condiment to flavor equally nutritious but cheaper vegetable food we may satisfy physiological necessities and at the same time supply the desired flavor and keep down living expenses noodles macaroni rice hominy celery peas beans cabbage and other vegetables cooked with a little meat or fish or with simply meat or fish broth are suitable and satisfying when presented as the substantial dish of the meal combined with cheese they become capable of supporting great physical activity whys of vegetables one why should a knowledge of the composition of vegetables be helpful to their proper cooking answer the way in which vegetables are to be treated during cooking depends upon the kind and quantity of the various foodstuffs that enter into their makeup the cooking should be such as will most fully retain the compounds which make that particular vegetable valuable two why cook vegetables answer in general vegetables are cooked to make them more digestible to cook the starch and soften the woody fibre three why are lettuce cress endive and the inner stalks of celery uncooked answer green vegetables are valued chiefly for flavour and mineral salts both would be lessened in cooking also these vegetables are or can be made crisp and thus are easily masticated four why should these vegetables be washed and dried carefully answer they must be washed with great care to free them of earth and minute insects that may be present they should be shaken dry for aesthetic reasons also that oil if used may adhere to them five why set all vegetables to cook in boiling water answer vegetables are set to cook in boiling water rather than in cold water that the flavor and nutritive properties be retained six should we always add salt to the boiling water answer salt is used with most vegetables it makes the water hard and raises the boiling point and both these things are an aid in keeping nutriment and flavor in vegetables but as salt hardens fiber its use must be avoided in vegetables containing much fiber seven should we cook beets turnips parsnips cabbage and salsify in salted water answer no because they contain considerable cellulose fiber season with salt just before they are done or sent to the table eight why cook asparagus spinach and green peas in a small quantity of boiling salted water answer they contain but little fiber also salt will intensify the green color and improve the appearance the quantity of water should be small that the withdrawal of flavor and nutrients be limited and the water should be saved the water clinging to the spinach after washing will suffice for its cooking nine why not use soda in the water in which peas spinach and other green vegetables are cooking answer soda softens the water thus drawing out juice flavor and color and making vegetables tasteless and faded ten why sometimes use a large quantity of water answer cabbage and onions are strong flavored and will often be improved if the flavor be lessened eleven why remove cabbage and onions from the water before they have entirely lost their crispness answer cabbage and onions are usually cooked too long both are more easily digested and assimilated if eaten while a little crisp twelve why soak dried vegetables in cold water for some hours before cooking answer dried vegetables have lost water by evaporation this must be restored to them in some measure before they will cook well thirteen why add soda to the water in which dried peas and beans are parboiled answer the hard cellular structure of dried peas and beans may be made tender in soft water if this be not at hand a teaspoonful of soda may be added to the water for a quart of beans near the close of the parboiling thorough rinsing in a fresh supply of water is essential before the continuation of the cooking fourteen why cook beets without removing the skins or breaking off the fine roots answer 
if the exterior of a beet be broken flavor juice and color are withdrawn in cooking fifteen why cook potatoes without paring them answer the skin helps to retain some of the nutritive properties of the potato sixteen why pare potatoes before boiling answer the potatoes if pared will be whiter and more attractive in appearance the loss of nutrients may be made good by other articles of food if the dietary be not restricted seventeen why bake potatoes white and sweet beets and squash so infrequently answer in baking vegetables all the nutritive properties are retained but the time of cooking is lengthened and more heat is required eighteen why not steam vegetables more often answer the nutritive properties are retained in steaming but the flavor is not as good as when the vegetables are baked while the time of cooking is about the same nineteen why not allow the water in which potatoes are cooking to boil rapidly answer if the water boils rapidly the outside crumbles before the center is cooked tender twenty why drain the water from potatoes or other vegetables as soon as they are done answer unless the water be drained at once from cooked vegetables they become water soaked and unpalatable twenty one why sprinkle salt over cooked potatoes as soon as they are drained answer salt has an affinity for water and sprinkled on the hot potatoes draws to itself surplus water making the potato white and mealy twenty two why blanch rice before cooking and macaroni after cooking answer by letting rice set over the fire in cold water heat very quickly to the boiling point boiling two minutes and rinsing in cold water the grains will be kept distinct while the cooking is completed the starch on the outside having been washed away pieces of macaroni set to cook in rapidly boiling water and stirred occasionally will keep distinct but when tender they must be rinsed in cold water or the starch upon the outside will cause them to adhere twenty three why cook rice and macaroni in rapidly boiling salted water answer if the water boils rapidly the rice and macaroni are kept in constant motion and will not adhere to the bottom of the vessel salt is added for flavor and also to raise the boiling point of the water salted water does not boil until after it is heated above two hundred twelve degrees fahrenheit in cooking starch the higher the degree of heat the shorter the time required for cooking twenty four why in mashing potatoes keep the saucepan on the stove and have the milk hot answer to be at their best mashed potatoes should be very hot and the flavor is impaired if reheated twenty five why in cooking cereals sprinkle the cereal into rapidly boiling salted water directly over the fire answer the salt is added for flavor stirring in rapidly boiling water keeps the grains distinct and the mixture smooth to lessen the liability of burning the cooking is completed over boiling water double boiler but as the temperature in the upper part of the boiler is below that of boiling water more time will be required than if the cooking be carried out as it was begun twenty six why should the cover be set ajar when potatoes are cooked and left on the back of the stove to dry off answer steam rises from hot potatoes if the cover be left ajar it escapes otherwise the steam would condense on the cover and drop on the cooked potatoes causing them to be water soaked recipes candied yams lay pared sweet potatoes or yams cut in halves lengthwise in a casserole sprinkle each layer as it is set in place with salt paprika and brown or maple sugar or honey dot with bits of crisco and add a little cinnamon if desired pour in about half a cupful of boiling water cover and let bake until tender when about half baked lift the potatoes next to the bottom of the dish to the top of the dish more water may be needed stuffed potatoes eight smooth regular shaped potatoes one cupful soft sifted bread crumbs one half cupful fine chopped cooked meats or nuts one fourth cupful melted crisco one half teaspoonful poultry seasoning one fourth teaspoonful salt one to two tablespoonfuls milk pare the potatoes cut them in halves lengthwise and cut out the centers 
to leave a hollow space in each mix all the other ingredients together and use to fill the hollow spaces put corresponding halves together fastening each with two wooden toothpicks set in a baking pan into a hot oven baste each ten minutes with hot crisco and let cook until tender serve at luncheon or supper onions stuffed with celery eight onions three tablespoonfuls crisco three tablespoonfuls flour one half teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful black pepper one cupful milk one half cupful celery broth two cupfuls cooked celery one half cupful cracker crumbs three tablespoonfuls crisco peel the onions and let cook in boiling water until tender cut out the centers to form thin walled cases while the onions are cooking melt the crisco in it cook the flour and seasonings add the milk and broth liquid in which the celery was cooked and stir until boiling add the celery cut before cooking in slices one-fourth an inch thick and use to fill the onions mix the cracker crumbs with the crisco and spread over the celery in the onions let cook in the oven until the crumbs are browned any of the cream celery left over may be served around the onions squash au gratin cut a squash in halves remove the seeds and stringy portions from such part of it as is required wash and set to cook in a steamer when done remove the pulp from the shell and press it through a ricer add salt pepper and a generous piece of crisco and beat well turn into a crisco dish mix two-thirds a cupful of cracker crumbs with one-fourth cupful of melted crisco and spread over the squash set into a hot oven to brown the crumbs sprinkle half a cupful of grated cheese over the squash before adding the crumbs baked macaroni and cheese three-quarter cupful macaroni in small pieces one cupful grated cheese one-fourth cupful melted crisco one-half teaspoonful paprika one tablespoonful crisco one tablespoonful flour one-half teaspoonful salt one cupful milk cook the macaroni in rapidly boiling salted water until tender drain rinse in cold water and drain again put the macaroni in a baking dish add the cheese and crisco and paprika with two forks lift the macaroni repeatedly or until the ingredients are well mixed melt the tablespoonful of crisco in it cook the flour and salt then add the milk and stir until boiling then pour over the macaroni sprinkle a little grated cheese over the top and set into the oven to melt the cheese and reheat the macaroni spaghetti with tomatoes three-quarter cupful spaghetti broken in pieces one half can tomatoes one half teaspoonful salt one tablespoonful sugar one half a green pepper in shreds one tablespoonful grated onion two tablespoonfuls crisco one half cupful grated cheese cook the spaghetti in rapidly boiling salted water until tender drain rinse in cold water and drain again cook the tomatoes salt sugar pepper and onion about half an hour add the spaghetti crisco and cheese and let become very hot over boiling water green corn creole style eight to ten ears green corn one half green pepper chopped one to two tablespoonfuls grated onion three tomatoes peeled and sliced one teaspoonful sugar one half teaspoonful salt two tablespoonfuls crisco cut the tips of the kernels from the corn on the cobs then with the back of the knife press out the pulp to these tips and the pulp add the onion the tomatoes sugar and salt and let cook until the liquid has evaporated somewhat add the crisco and more seasoning if needed stewed cabbage remove any imperfect leaves from a head of new cabbage cut the cabbage in quarters discarding the hard portion in the center let stand in cold water about an hour drain and shred rather coarse cover with boiling water and let cook partly covered from half to three-fourths of an hour drain in a colander and return to the fire with for a quart a cupful of cream and stir until boiling add a teaspoonful of salt half a teaspoonful of paprika and a tablespoonful of crisco in little bits let simmer two or three minutes then serve onions stuffed with ham 
eight onions one cupful chopped ham cooked one cupful soft sifted bread crumbs one quarter cupful melted crisco one half teaspoonful paprika one half teaspoonful salt one tablespoonful fine chopped parsley one cupful milk or broth peel the onions and let cook in boiling water until nearly tender let cool a little and cut out the centers to leave a thin wall of onion chop the onion removed and mixed with the other ingredients except the broth and use to fill the onion cases rounding the mixture above more salt may be needed pour the broth or milk around the onions set in a baking dish and let cook half an hour or longer in the oven serve with or without cream sauce chopped nut meats may be used in place of the ham broiled tomatoes cut off a thin slice from the ends of each tomato do not peel them cut them in halves crosswise sprinkle with salt and pepper dip in melted crisco and then in cracker crumbs set in a well criscoed broiler and let cook over the coals or under a gas flame from six to eight minutes turning two or three times serve on slices of toast or on flat cakes of hamburg steak creamed cabbage au gratin three cupfuls chopped cooked cabbage one fourth cupful crisco one fourth cupful flour one half teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful paprika two cupfuls milk one half to one cupful grated cheese two thirds cupful cracker crumbs three tablespoonfuls melted crisco cut a crisp head of cabbage in quarters and remove the central stock from each piece freshen in cold water if needed set to cook in a large saucepan of boiling water uncovered let boil from half to three-fourths an hour but remove from the fire before the crispness is gone chop rather coarse for three cupfuls of the cooked cabbage melt the crisco add the flour and seasonings and let cook until frothy add the milk and stir until boiling add the grated cheese and the cabbage mix and turn into a baking dish cover with the cracker crumbs mixed with the crisco and set into the oven until the crumbs are browned timbales of spinach two quarts spinach one half teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful sugar one half teaspoonful pepper three egg yolks beaten light one and one half cupfuls brown sauce remove outside leaves and coarse stalks from the spinach wash thoroughly changing the water many times add salt and let boil ten to fifteen minutes turning the spinach many times use no water but that clinging to the spinach after washing drain in a colander pressing out all the water chop very fine add the seasonings and the egg yolks and mix thoroughly turn into crisco timbal molds fitted with a round of paper in the bottom press into the molds compactly set the molds in a baking dish on many folds of paper and turn boiling water around the molds to half their height let cook until firm serve with cream sauce if the spinach is served with meat having a sauce this sauce will answer for both dishes canned peas with fresh carrots one large carrot one canned peas one teaspoonful salt one teaspoonful sugar one half teaspoonful black pepper three tablespoonfuls crisco scrape or pare the carrots and cut in small pieces of the same size slices cut in quarters or inch long strips are suitable wash then let simmer in boiling water until tender the time will depend on the age of the carrots when cooked the water should be nearly evaporated drain the peas rinse in cold water cover with boiling water let boil vigorously then drain and add to the carrots add the seasonings shake until well mixed and serve at once jerusalem artichokes jerusalem artichokes resemble potatoes in appearance but in composition they are more like turnips pare and throw into cold water to keep them from turning black set to cook in boiling salted water when nearly tender twenty or twenty five minutes prepare a white sauce a cupful is enough for four or five artichokes using half cream and half water in which the artichokes were cooked as the liquid drain the cooked artichokes shake over a hot stove lid to dry off then turn into a hot dish and pour the sauce over them a little onion or lemon juice or both may be added to the sauce baked winter squash cut or break squash into pieces of a size suitable to serve individually 
remove seeds and stringy portions but retain the skin bake in the oven as potatoes the time will be from thirty to forty minutes corn pudding three tablespoonfuls cornmeal one teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful paprika one half cupful cold milk two cupfuls hot milk one tablespoonful crisco one cupful fresh corn pulp or one half can corn or cornlet two eggs stir the cornmeal with the salt paprika and cold milk then stir into the hot milk cook and stir over boiling water until the mixture thickens remove from the fire and stir in the other ingredients turn into a criscoed baking dish suitable to send to the table set on several folds of paper in a dish of boiling water let cook until the centre is firm serve hot as a vegetable with the meat course or with bread and butter at luncheon or supper one or two tablespoonfuls of chopped green or red pepper is an addition to the dish well worth trying franconia potatoes for roast meat pare the required number of potatoes cover with boiling salted water and let cook about fifteen minutes drain and set to cook around a roast of meat baste with hot fat each time the meat is basted let cook about forty minutes grilled sweet potatoes peel cold boiled or baked sweet potatoes and cut them lengthwise into slices about half an inch thick dip these in melted crisco season with salt and pepper and set in a well criscoed broiler let cook until well browned first on one side and then on the other serve hot with steak chops sausages etc browned hashed potatoes one third cupful crisco six to eight cold boiled potatoes one teaspoonful salt one half teaspoonful pepper heat the crisco in a cast iron frying pan put in the potatoes chopped fine sprinkle on the salt and pepper mix all together thoroughly while the potatoes are becoming hot cover and let cook over a moderate fire until the potatoes are brown next to the pan run a spatula beneath half of the potatoes and turn this half over the other hold in place while any surplus fat is drained off then loosen the underside of the potato from the pan and turn on to a hot serving dish mashed potatoes select eight or ten old potatoes of the same size pare and let stand in cold water two hours or longer boil in salted water until done about twenty minutes drain sprinkle with salt and return partly covered to the back of the range have ready a second saucepan and about half a cupful of cream or milk with two or three tablespoonfuls of crisco hot on the stove press the potatoes through a ricer into the second saucepan sprinkle on a teaspoonful or more of salt and beat vigorously with a slitted wooden spoon the potatoes should be light and fluffy neither too moist nor too dry pile lightly in a hot dish and serve at once salad dressings french dressing three tablespoonfuls oil one to three tablespoonfuls lemon juice or vinegar one quarter teaspoonful salt one eighth teaspoonful pepper the ingredients for the dressing may be mixed and poured at once over the salad materials which are then turned over and over until the dressing has been taken up by them or the condiments mixed with the oil may be first used then after each leaf or separate piece has been thoroughly coated with the oil the acid may be poured on and the salad turned over and over until the acid is evenly mixed throughout neither french nor mayonnaise dressing should be strongly acid and one tablespoonful of acid to three of oil is a good proportion in most salads for fish and beets two tablespoonfuls of acid to three of oil would be preferred by many equal quantities of oil and acid are favored by people accustomed to using so-called oil dressings or by those accustomed to eating vinegar on cucumbers or tomatoes tomatoes are mildly acid and it is a mistake to overpower this natural acid with a quantity of vinegar a very little vinegar or lemon juice in a dressing will give point to or bring out the natural acid flavor of the tomato mayonnaise dressing olive oil one egg yolk beaten light one quarter teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful paprika two tablespoonfuls lemon juice or vinegar one cupful olive oil two tablespoonfuls boiling water to the beaten yolk add the salt paprika and acid 
and beat with an egg beater until well blended add one teaspoonful of olive oil and beat in it thoroughly then add another teaspoonful of oil and when this is thoroughly blended with the other ingredients add a third teaspoonful continue in the same manner adding the oil in a short time by the tablespoonful until a cupful in olive oil has been used then beat in the boiling water a tablespoonful at a time if all of the dressing is not used at once cover it with an earthen or glass dish and set it aside in a cool place use of french and mayonnaise dressing a french dressing is used for green vegetables for fruit and nuts and to season cooked vegetables meat or fish to be used later with mayonnaise dressing french dressing is used on salads served at dinner mayonnaise dressing is used for delicate meats fish bananas apples and pineapples and for some vegetables as cauliflower asparagus and tomatoes the vegetables enumerated above dressed with mayonnaise are sometimes served as an entree at dinner but in general mayonnaise dressing is reserved for use at luncheon or banquets cooked dressings are used in place of mayonnaise but there is no substitute for french dressing mayonnaise dressing with crisco one cupful crisco unmelted two egg yolks beaten light one teaspoonful mustard one teaspoonful salt one quarter teaspoonful paprika one quarter teaspoonful black pepper four tablespoonfuls vinegar beat the crisco to a cream very gradually beat in the yolks then the seasonings and lastly drop by drop the vinegar end of section ten section eleven of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b cooking suggestions suggestions for cooking at high altitudes at sea level water boils at two hundred twelve degrees fahrenheit at higher altitudes the air is rarer and atmospheric pressure is diminished and water boils at a lower temperature than two hundred twelve degrees fahrenheit for each rise of about five hundred and thirty feet above sea level the boiling point of water falls one degree at five thousand feet above sea level the boiling point of water is about two hundred two degrees fahrenheit and at ten thousand one feet the boiling point is about one hundred ninety three degrees fahrenheit thus when potatoes are boiling at ten thousand feet altitude they are subjected to about the same degree of heat as potatoes cooking on the coast in a double boiler or a fireless cooker and in consequence a longer time must be allowed to cook them in a few words while thirty minutes will suffice to cook a potato on the sea coast from sixty to ninety minutes would be needed at ten thousand feet this variation depends on atmospheric pressure which varies according to the altitude all other lines of cooking are influenced by this same variation of pressure as strong heat is necessary to sear over the outside of meats to be boiled or roasted that the juices be kept within the meat and as boiling water at high altitudes sears over but imperfectly it is best to subject such joints first to hot dry heat in a frying pan turn the meat as each surface is crusted over until all the surfaces have been so treated then transfer to boiling water or the oven to complete the cooking at the usual temperature one hundred sixty five degrees to one hundred seventy degrees fahrenheit in cake making at high altitudes the external atmospheric pressure being less the cell walls holding the gases generated by the leavening agents and the creaming of the crisco and the sugar tend to expand too much burst and run together and the outer cell walls not yet being sufficiently hardened by heat also settle and the cake is heavy the remedy is to maintain equilibrium between external and internal pressure and this is done by the formation of less air cells i e in practice by the use of less shortening and sugar or less leavening agent or by increasing the tenacity of the dough in practice by being sure to use fresh eggs and more of them any of the recipes for cakes cookies or shortened mixtures given in this book can probably be used successfully by simply cutting down the quantity of crisco 
one third and sugar one fourth sugar and water for frosting and fondant requiring longer cooking than at sea level the syrup will register from two hundred eighteen degrees to two hundred twenty degrees fahrenheit at the soft ball stage weights and measures three teaspoonfuls of liquid equal one tablespoonful four tablespoonfuls of liquid equal one half gill or one quarter a cupful one half a cupful equals one gill two gills equal one cupful two cupfuls equal one pint two pints four cupfuls equal one quart four cupfuls of liquid equal one quart four cupfuls of flour equal one pound or one quart two cupfuls of crisco solid equal one pound one half a cupful of crisco solid equals one quarter a pound four ounces two cupfuls of granulated sugar equal one pound two and one half cupfuls of powdered sugar equal one pound one pint of milk or water equals one pound one pint of chopped meat solid equals one pound ten eggs without shells equal one pound eight eggs with shells equal one pound two tablespoonfuls of crisco equal one ounce four tablespoonfuls of crisco equal two ounces or one quarter a cupful two tablespoonfuls of granulated sugar equal one ounce four tablespoonfuls of flour equal one ounce four tablespoonfuls of ground coffee equal one ounce one tablespoonful of liquid equals one half ounce one cupful of liquid to one cupful of flour for poor batters one cupful of liquid to two cupfuls of flour for drop batters one cupful of liquid to three cupfuls of flour for dough one third to two or more cakes of compressed yeast softened in one half cupful of water to two cupfuls of liquid one third yeast cake to two cupfuls of liquid is used in bread mixed at night one cake or more according to the time available for rising when bread is mixed in the morning by using several yeast cakes to two cupfuls of liquid bread may be baked in three or four hours from time of mixing one half a cupful of liquid yeast either compressed yeast dissolved in one half cupful liquid or any other yeast such as potato yeast to two cupfuls of liquid one teaspoonful of soda and three and one half level teaspoonfuls of cream of tartar to four cupfuls of flour two teaspoonfuls of baking powder to one cupful of flour when eggs are not used one teaspoonful of soda to two cupfuls of thick sour milk one teaspoonful of soda to one cupful of molasses one quarter a teaspoonful of salt to four cupfuls of milk for custards one quarter a teaspoonful of salt to one cupful or one teaspoonful to four cupfuls of sauce or soup one teaspoonful of flavoring extract to four cupfuls of custard or cream one tablespoonful of flavoring extract to four cupfuls of mixture to be frozen two-thirds cupful or less of sugar to four cupfuls of milk for custards etc one cupful of sugar to four cupfuls of milk or cream for ice cream four eggs to four cupfuls of milk for plain cup custard six to eight eggs to four cupfuls of milk for molded custards one quarter a package or half an ounce of gelatin to two cupfuls scant of liquid three cupfuls of water or of milk or stock to one cupful of rice one ounce two tablespoonfuls of crisco one half ounce two tablespoonfuls of flour to one cupful of liquid for sauce one ounce two tablespoonfuls of crisco one half ounce two tablespoonfuls of flour to two cupfuls of liquid for soups one cupful of cooked meat or fish cut in cubes to three quarter or one whole cupful of sauce meat from three and one half pound chicken equals about two cupfuls or one pound things to remember in connection with the recipes when using in place of butter add salt in the proportion of one level teaspoonful to one cupful of crisco when there is smoke in the kitchen crisco has burned or heated too high for frying or some may have been on the outside of the pan or kettle when using crisco in your regular recipes remember that as it contains no moisture it is much richer than butter and therefore one quarter less should be used in making sauces thoroughly blend the flour and crisco 
before adding the milk in using melted crisco in boiled dressing croquettes rolls fritters etc be sure that the melted crisco is cooled sufficiently so that the hot fat will not injure the texture of the foods crisco like butter is susceptible to heat and cold when too hard simply put in a warm place end of section eleven recording by betty b end of the wise of cooking by janet mackenzie hill